Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to the last in our series of four interfaith dialogues and congratulations to those of you who've been all four, to all four, you deserve a medal. Um, our theme for this evening is Jesus and the Bible or Muhammad and the Quran. Now, many of you I know will have been at, uh, at some of the meetings before, but for those of you who haven't, let me explain the, the uh, format for this evening. Uh, this evening, Dr. Sharosh will speak first, uh, and Shabir Ali will follow him. Um, both speakers will speak first of all for 40 minutes and make their main case. There will then be a rebuttal for 18 minutes each, and then a second uh, rebuttal of nine minutes each. Now that, we hope, will take us through till about half past nine. Uh, there'll then be a break for prayers, and also during that time, there'll be the collection of written questions. We're not taking questions from the floor, but during the second uh, speech, uh, sorry, the, the third speech, the second rebuttal uh, of uh, both speakers, um, there'll be pens and paper distributed. So if you'd like to write down questions, they will then be collected and brought to the front. Uh, and after the prayer time, we'll gather again and there'll be questions and a response from both speakers. The question and answer time will last, we uh, think about 20 minutes. We aim to conclude tonight about 10 past 10. But those of you who've been here regularly will know that something goes on technically each night, so it may be a bit later, but it's the last night, and I hope you'll, uh, you'll forgive us if we go on a bit longer. Let me introduce our speakers for this evening. Mr. Shabir Ali is from Canada. Uh, he lives uh, there with his wife and four children. He is president of the Islamic Information and Dawah Center International in Toronto in Canada. He holds a BA in Religious Studies from Laurentian University in Canada and is currently completing his master's degree with the Department for the Study of Religion at the University of Toronto. Mr. Ali has served for many years as an Imam and a public speaker for Islam. And he appears as a regular guest on a weekly television broadcast in Canada called Let the Quran Speak. He is represented and spoken on behalf of Islam in many interfaith dialogues and debates. Here in this church, he's had uh, dialogues with Dr. Joel Marcus and others. And elsewhere, he's debated Dr. John Warwick Montgomery and international scholar Dr. William Lane Craig. Mr. Ali is a student of the experienced masters who've trodden the path of interfaith dialogue and debate, people such as Sheikh Ahmed Didat and Dr. Jamal Badawi. Perhaps we'd like to, to welcome Shibir Ali tonight. Welcome. <laughs> Dr. Anish Sharosh uh, and his wife together for almost 40 years have been involved in international missions in over se in, uh, 79 countries. Uh, and his foundation, the Anish Sharosh Evangelistic Association, has sponsored over 50 students in their pursuit of higher education. Dr. Sharosh has produced numerous TV programs and documentaries, especially on the Holy Land, where he was born. He hails from Nazareth, uh, as does another of our, uh, our well, Jesus Christ. So, a uh, good time to come from. Uh, his degrees, his academic degrees, include a Bachelor of Arts from Mississippi College, a Master of Theology from New Orleans Seminary, a Doctor of Ministry from Luther Rice Seminary, and a Doctor of Philosophy from Oxford Graduate School in Dayton, Tennessee. Dr. Shalosh has written 10 books. Uh, of these uh, that he's written so far, the book Islam Revealed has been the most popular. Uh, his latest book is Islam, A Threat or a Challenge. And a few of these books are available here tonight. If they run out, you can order them. So if you'd like to get hold of one of these books, do speak to Dr. Shadosh or one of the team afterwards. So we're grateful to God for the presence of each person here tonight, and we continue to pray for a friendly and a gracious atmosphere during these debates. I think it's fair to say that uh, each evening, because we're discussing material that's very personal to all of us here, we will hear things that we disagree with, often passionately disagree with. Uh, can I emphasize that we are here uh, to listen to each other, and we can't listen to each other or hear each other if there's noise going on. So however strongly we disagree with what we hear, can I emphasize again that we will show respect by not shouting out or calling out uh, during the uh, speeches or presentations or in, even uh, in, in the end. Um, and we will give the speakers themselves a chance to respond to uh, the other person's uh, comments and presentation. So let me emphasize that. Please, no calling out, no cheering, outcries. However well made the point you, you think the point is, please applaud at the end of each speech, uh, but uh, no cat calls or anything during it. Um, 
a few practical things. If you have a mobile, please turn it off uh, so that we're not interrupting um, the, the, the speakers. Um, and we say that each night someone always forgets and they're always embarrassed when they forget to do it. So please don't be the one who forgets to do it. Um, can I also ask that uh, the only food or drink we consume here is, uh, is water. Um, we don't want to leave litter behind us as we did on the first evening. So please, any, any food and drink, to save that till, till afterwards. Um, the speakers have both asked that after the first five minutes, there be no photography. So if you want to take photographs, please do so in the first five minutes of their main presentations uh, so that you, we're not interrupting the flow of their arguments later on. Uh, there'll be no videoing. Please, please don't video the event. It's being videoed professionally. Uh, and if you want to get hold of a copy of the video when it's ready, if you could leave your details, uh, your name and address, uh, and there are forms available at the, at the e exit to do that. Uh, there are stewards around the building. You recognize them with their clothing and badges. And can I just ask uh, or, or remind you that if people do not adhere to these rules, particularly the ones about disrupting the speakers, uh, we'll have to ask you to, to leave. As I've said already, papers and pens will be handed out at the rebuttal stage uh, for you to write questions, these will be collected and then uh, handed in. Uh, now the fire exits in the unlikely event that we have a fire, fire exits you find on the right there or at the back of the hall. Uh, the gents' toilets are uh, down the, through the door there and downstairs. Uh, the ladies' toilets are upstairs and uh, at the foyer in the front and all are signposted. Now, those who uh, wish to carry out their ablutions before prayer, uh, there are uh, limited facilities, uh, but there is space available. But we suggest, because time is short during the break, uh, that if you want to carry out ablutions before prayer, uh, that you perhaps sneak out just a little bit early uh, to, to make preparation. Uh, and if there should be any kind of emergency, please just remain calm. The stewards will tell us what to do. That is my long list of things I have to get through. Now we're ready to uh, hear Dr. Shadosh. So welcome. We look forward to your presentation. I greet you all in the name of Jesus the Christ, my Lord and Savior and the man from my hometown of Nazareth. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power to everyone who believes. You should not be surprised as I stand before you to say, I apologize, ask you to forgive me, if any of you thought that I had in any way insulted you or said something to offend you. I am here to do what Jesus and the word of God says, to speak the truth in love. The matter is not a fight or a battle between me and my good friend, but it is a matter of searching for the truth. And I believe that's why you're here. I praise God for the privilege of being with you. I trust that you'll accept these words. The title of this presentation is indeed worthy of our consideration. It's very essential to explain at the outset that the difficulties which our Muslim friends have historically stem from a misunderstanding of the biblical Jesus, the Messiah, and the Word of God. We are fascinated that the Quran declares that Jesus has 33 titles and is mentioned 97 times in 93 verses of the Quran. We should clarify that Jesus the Messiah is like a monetary coin. He has two natures. One is human, one is divine. They've been stuck with the human. We hope they will see the divine. Muslims have been blessed with great reverence for Jesus as a great prophet, but not as the incarnate deity. The fact is, he is called often in the scriptures, the son of man, which actually means the son of humanity. Yet he is much more than that. He is the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, your Savior and mine. The Gospel writers relate to us how they perceived this unique and exclusive Son of God as they understood him. Matthew brings up all the Old Testament prophecies in which Jesus of Nazareth is portrayed as the Messiah of God and a descendant of King David, worthy of the throne forever. Mark, who wrote a fast-paced gospel, particularly with the Romans in mind, tells that Jesus is indeed the Savior of mankind. Luke, as a physician, portrays Jesus as the compassionate, miracle-working son of humanity. John tells us that this his best friend, Jesus the Christ, is truly the son of God and God incarnate, who came in flesh, lived among us, died on a Roman cross as a substitution and a sacrifice for sinful humanity. 
Then he arose the third day victorious over sin and the grave ascended and one day shall return. Christians wonder why their Muslim friends have no problem believing that God became a book, revealed himself in a book called the Quran and not comprehend that God could become a man to get close to us. If God could reveal himself through a book, why can't we accept the fact that he also reveals himself as a human being? Did he not incarnate himself in a burning bush to reveal himself to Moses and declare, I am the God out of the bush of your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Whenever we declare that God is almighty, whenever we declare that God is almighty, then refuse to accept his revelation in the person of Jesus the Christ, we no longer attribute omnipotence to him. In short, our God becomes too small if we limit him to our own understanding of what he should be like. Hebrews 1, 1 to 9 declares, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. But when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. Inasmuch as he has graciously and generously provided us with everything needed for us to survive and enjoy life on this planet Earth, we really are very blessed. The necessities for our livelihood, as well as the things of, for our entertainment and pleasure, whether fruits, plants, animals, sea creatures, birds, gold, silver, diamonds, all and, and, and anything else are found in abundance on our planet. What is missing? Salvation. Because we are all sinners, we cannot redeem each other. Someone has to come from beyond this spaceship called planet Earth without sin to redeem sinners such as we are. So why should we reject God's revelation of himself in this extraordinary manner in the person of God the Son whose name is Jesus which means Savior. His title Messiah means the anointed God as King, Priest and Prophet. He is the only one who has ever carried all these titles in history. The third title is Lord. Throughout the scripture these titles are combined such as the Lord Jesus the Christ or Christ Jesus the Lord. That, of course, identifies his divinity. No one in history is worthy of these titles except Jesus of Nazareth, the son of the living God. Revelation identifies him as king of kings and lord of lords. The incomparable, the incomparable Jesus, the Messiah. So let's look at the impressive life and works of this incredible prophet. What prophet had an angel announce his conception? Luke 1, 26 to 33. What prophet had the town of his birth foretold centuries before it happened? Micah 5.2 What prophet was born of a virgin? Isaiah 7.14 What prophet had angels announce his birth over the hills of Judea? Luke 2.8-14 What prophet had wise men of the east worship him while in the cradle? Matthew 2.1-12 What prophet had a devout man, a devout man in Jerusalem speak of him so highly? Luke 2.25-32 what prophet battled Satan three times and won? Luke 4, 1 to 12. What prophet announced a prophecy of 700 years was fulfilled in him when he preached in Nazareth? Luke 4, 16 to 21. So he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. When he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah, when he had opened the book, he found the place where it is written, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book, gave it to, back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture 
is fulfilled in your hearing. What prophet healed every sick person who came to him one evening according to Luke 4.40? What prophet healed a leper without asking God's permission? Luke 5, 12 to 13. What prophet healed the paralytic and forgave his sins as only God Almighty can forgive sin, according to Luke 5, 16 to 26? What prophet raised a youth from his coffin on his way to the cemetery, Luke 7, 11 to 16, and Lazarus when he was buried for four days? What prophet stilled the storm over Galilee? Matthew 8. 23 to 27. What prophet walked on the waters of the Sea of Galilee? Matthew 14, 22 to 33. What prophet demonstrated his divinity on a mountaintop? According to Mark 9, 1 to 7. And he said to them, Assuredly I say to you that there are some standing here who will not taste death till they see the kingdom of God present with power. Now, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them on a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. His clothes became shining exceedingly white, like snow, such as no launderer on earth can whiten them. And Elijah appeared on to them with Moses, and they were walking with Jesus, talking with Jesus. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, it's good for us to be here. Let's make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah, because he did not know what to say. For they were greatly afraid. And a cloud came and overshadowed them. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. What prophet predicted that one of his followers would betray him? Luke 22, 21 to 23. What prophet predicted that another of his, one of his followers would deny him? John 13, 36 to 38. What prophet had the price paid to his betrayer foretold centuries before it happened Zechariah 11:12 what prophet prophesied his own death and resurrection Luke 9:43 to 44 and they were amazed at the majesty of God but while everyone marveled at all the things which Jesus did he said to his disciples let these words sink down in your ears for the son of man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men what prophet claimed he was greater than Solomon? Luke 11, 31 to 32. What prophet compassionately wept over his city and his nation? Matthew 23, 37 to 39. What prophet was welcomed as king of Israel? Luke 19, 37 to 38. What prophet proclaimed that he was both son and lord of David? Luke 20, 41 to 44. What prophet gave numerous signs predicting his second coming? Mark 13, 5 to 13. What prophet predicted the destruction of Jerusalem 37 years before it happened? According to Luke 21, 20 to 24. What prophet dried up a fig tree with a word? Matthew 21, 18 to 19. What prophet used the fig tree as an illustration of his second coming? Mark 13, 28 to 31. What prophet declared his word was eternal? Matthew 24, 35. What prophet was in existence from the beginning of creation, according to 1 John 1, 1 to 3? That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus the Christ. What prophet was recognized as part of the triune God? 2 Corinthians 13, 14. What prophet claimed to come down from heaven? John 6, 37 to 40. What prophet claimed to raise anybody from among the dead? John 5, 21. What prophet claimed that his words would give eternal life? John 5, 24. What prophet claimed to have life source like God Almighty? John 5, 26. What prophet healed a man who was born blind? John 9, 1 to 38. What prophet revealed to a former blind man that he was the son of God? John 9, 35 to 37. Jesus heard that they had cast him out. When he had found him, he said to him, do you believe in the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, You have both seen him, and it is he 
who is talking with you? What prophet allowed a blind man whom he healed to worship him? John 9, 38. What prophet fed the multitudes from five loaves and two fish? John 6, 1 to 15. What prophet challenged others? Which of you convicts me of sin? John 8, 46. What prophet claimed to be in the form and equal with God? Philippians 2, 5 to 6. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. What prophet was predicted to die among thieves? 700 years before Mark 15, 27 to 28. What prophet was to have his clothing become a gambling game? Psalms 22, 18. What prophet was to be abandoned by his followers? Mark 15, 50. What prophet was to be abandoned by God? Psalms 22, 1. What prophet was to die as a vicarious sacrifice? Isaiah 53, 5. What prophet prophesied that he would die but rise the third day? Mark 9, 31. For he taught his disciples and said to them, The Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And after he is killed, he will rise the third day. What prophet did rise the third day? And appeared twelve times, Luke 24, 31 to 48. What prophet had angels announce his resurrection? John 20, 12. What prophet spoke in the name of the triune God, then his own divinity? John 3, 11 to 13. What prophet ascended to heaven while his followers watched? Acts 1, 9. Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. What prophet had angels announced he was to return? Acts 1, 10 to 11. What prophet had a prophecy by another prophet that he would return? From the book of Daniel, chapter 7, verse 13 to 14. And I read that to you right now. I was watching in the night vision, and behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven, he came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one which, will, which shall not be destroyed. Has there ever been a personality in the history of the human race whose credentials come anywhere close to Jesus of Nazareth? The Messiah of God, the Lord of creation, who came to earth to love us and bring us back to the Heavenly Father by paying fully for our sins through his precious blood shed on Calvary for you and for me. The Bible is the living word of God. Evaluation of the Bible. This book reveals the mind of God the state of man, the way of salvation, the doom of sinners, and the happiness of believers. Its doctrines are holy, its precepts are binding, its histories are true, and its decisions are immutable. Read it to be wise, believe it to be safe, and practice it to be holy. It contains light to direct you, food to support you, and comfort to cheer you. It is the traveler's map, the pilgrim's staff, the pilot's compass, and the Christian's character and charter. Here too, heaven is opened and the gates of hell disclosed. Christ is its grand subject, our good, it's its design, and the glory of God, its end. It should fill the memory, rule the heart, and guide the feet. Read it slowly, frequently, prayerfully. It's a mine of wealth, a paradise of glory, and a river of pleasure. It is given you in life, will be opened at the judgment, and be remembered forever. It involves highest responsibility, will reward the greatest labor, and condemn all who trifle with its sacred contents. The Holy Bible does claim to be the Word of God. In a letter written September 1703 by the English philosopher John Locke, a young preacher wrote him asking advice as to how he might have a successful ministry. Locke wrote him to preach the Bible, for it has God for its author, salvation for its end, and truth without any mixture of error for its matter. Through the centuries, a few insignificant copyist errors have crept into copies of later manuscripts, but they do not affect the message. The Bible is not a textbook in history, the sciences, philosophy, psychology, for example, but where it speaks on these subjects, it speaks the truth. You don't need to discard your intellectual honesty when you read the Bible 
or study it or hear it preached for it is God's authoritative inerrant word. Psalms 199 declares, how can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. Verse 11, your word I have hidden in my heart that I may not sin against thee. Verse 133, direct my steps by your word and let no iniquity have dominion over me. Romans 15, 4, for whatever things were written before were written for our learning that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Second Peter 1, 16 to 21, I'm sure Shabir probably knows this by heart with his good studying and memorization. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Hebrews 4.12 For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and is discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. John 17.17 17, Jesus declared in his high priestly prayer sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. John 1.1 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The historical record of the Bible itself. Genesis 1, 1 and 2. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. The beginning of the entire Bible presents us with the creation of the universe by God Almighty. Yet no one was present when that happened. Therefore, we must ask, what did actually transpire and who is it that related that? Here is the answer in Genesis 2, 15 to 17. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in that day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. We understand very clearly that Adam was on talking terms with the creator God. Therefore he knew from God himself about the creation of the universe as well as how God made it. Additionally, in Genesis 3, 8 to 16, we discover that God actually incarnated himself on a daily basis and communicated with Adam and Eve. And they heard the sound of the Lord walking, I repeat, walking in the garden in the cool of the day. You can't walk if you don't have feet, you know. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. And all of you know the rest of the story, I'm sure. It's obvious that since God walked with Adam and Eve in the garden, he must have appeared in a human form. Of course, that means Jesus, who is God incarnate, was in existence from the beginning of time. However, in his awesome love for us, once we rebelled against him, he came again in the form of the babe of Bethlehem to restore us to fellowship we once had with the Heavenly Father. Enoch. Enoch, who was the first human being to go to glory without dying, we call him Idris, assures us that there is life beyond the grave and there is a place called heaven. Genesis 5.21. At age 365, he knew Adam, and must have experienced the oral traditions about Jehovah God. According to the genealogy of the Bible, he also had a son by the name of Methuselah. Methuselah lived longer than anyone in history, 969 years, Genesis 5.17. Because of his longevity, he knew the information about the previous generations. By the way, some of you know I'm 72, so I've been hoping I'll live to be 126 to tell Moses I lived longer than he did by one year. <laughs> Methuselah lived until the time of the flood of Noah. This, of course, explains that Noah was well informed through Methuselah. Genesis 5, 27, 29. Noah's firstborn was Shem, who lived until the time of Abraham, according to Genesis 10, 21. And children were born also to Shem, the father of all the children of Eber, the brother of Japheth, the elder. Genesis 11:10 10 to 11 tells us, this is the genealogy of Shem. 
Shem was 100 years old and begot Arphaxad two years after the flood. After he begot Arphaxad, Shem lived 500 years and begot sons and daughters. Then in Genesis 11:26 we discover Abraham. Now Terah lived 70 years and begot Abram, Nahor, and Haran. According to Genesis 18:17 to 19, the living God confirms Abraham as the bearer of clear information about previous events in history. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him? For I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him that they may keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken. Religion is not God's interest. It's relationship. We have only two religions in the world. Salvation by grace, salvation by works. The pivotal role of Abraham in being used of God as a source of inspiration, information and blessing is seen in Galatians 3.8. The following passage substantiates the authenticity of the scripture as being inspired or God breathed. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand saying in you all the nations shall be blessed. Moses was instrumental in preserving the biblical record according to Deuteronomy 31, 24 to 26. So it was, when Moses had completed writing the words of this law in a book, when they were finished, that Moses commanded the Levites who bore the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, saying, Take this book of the law, put it beside the Ark of the Covenant of the law of the Lord your God, that it may be there as a witness against you. Joshua 1, 8 informs us what God wanted Joshua to do about the book. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. The Prince of Prophets, Isaiah of Jerusalem, addresses the entire world as a spokesman for God in Isaiah 1-2. Hear, O heavens, and give, earth, o, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children and they have rebelled against me. In his 40 years of powerful ministry, God Almighty tells Isaiah something fantastic. 59, 21. As for me, says the Lord, this is my covenant with them. My spirit who is upon you and my words which I have put in your mouth shall not depart from your mouth nor from the mouth of your descendants nor from the mouth of your descendants descendants says the Lord from this time and forevermore. Nearly 2,700 years later, the discovery by Ahmed al Deeb of the Dead Sea Scrolls at Qumran near the Dead Sea verified the accuracy of the scripture. There were two scrolls of Isaiah written in ancient Hebrew which were found in 1947 that are precisely the same context as we have in our modern Bibles of the 21st century. What an incredible find. I studied them, searched them, crawled in the caves where they found them because the fact is all the books of the Old Testament were found and the great scholars and archaeologists have dated these document, documents to the 3rd century before Christ. The only missing link was the book of Esther because the Essenes didn't think it had anything to do with the Bible because it didn't have the word God in it. Jeremiah 36 2 provides further evidence of the written record of the scripture. God is speaking to Jeremiah, take a scroll of a book. And write on it all the words that I have spoken to you against Israel, against Judah, and against all the nations from the day I spoke to you, from the days of Josiah even to this day. The prophet Daniel enunciates in 9.2 the validity of the written word. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem. Malachi is the book that concludes the Old Testament. We are told in chapter 3 verse 16, Then those who fear the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord listened and heard them. So a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who meditate on his name. In our brief survey of the Old Testament, it becomes quite obvious that the living word, the living God, 
watched carefully over the development of his holy word throughout the generations. He inspired the writers to put down their teachings and prophecies in a correct and proper manner for the good of the succeeding generations and for us. The Creator God ensured that after inspiring his laws and instructions, they were preserved accurately in accordance with his will, purpose, and promise. In the New Testament record. Jesus announced very positively in Matthew 5, 17 to 18, the following. Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Furthermore, he promised the disciples, but when they deliver you up, do not worry about how or what you should speak. For it will be given to you in that hour what you should speak. For it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your father who speaks in you. Matthew 5, 17 to 18. Paul the apostle declares an identical truth in 1 Corinthians 2, 12 to 13. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us, these things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Peter concurs with this view in 1 Peter 1.23. Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Peter makes a proclamation which is extremely revealing, an extraordinary in 2 Peter 1, 22 and 21, knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they moved by the Holy Spirit, as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. The entire scripture of 66 books includes a fearsome warning to anyone who may try to change it. Revelation 22, 18 to 19 expresses God's concern for his word. For I testify to everyone. Who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. For those of you who will declare that this statement concerns itself with the book of Revelation only. Here is the answer from the scriptures found in 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Ancient biblical manuscripts, Alexandrinus. This handwritten document dates to 325 AD and was presented to King Charles of England by the Patriarch of Constantinople in 1620. It is written in Greek on parchment, and because it was brought from Alexandria, it is called Alexandrus. Anyone can view this ancient document of the entire Bible at the British Museum in London. Codex Vaticanus. Because it is kept in the Vatican Library, it is called Codex Vaticanus. It includes the entire Bible in Greek, written about the year 350 AD on beautiful parchment in plain standard script. Ephraimitis. This valuable document dating back to 450 AD contains all the books of the Bible in Greek. It is displayed at the National Library of Paris, France. Sinaiticus. Tischendorf, a German traveling scholar, discovered this valuable document when he stopped at St. Catherine's Monastery in Sinai, which I visited in 1990. The Codex dates back to the 300 AD and is written on vellum. Tischendorf presented this priceless document of the New Testament to Tsar Alexander of Russia. It was later sold to the British Museum in London. This document precedes the Quran by more than 300 years and is a perfect match to the New Testament of today. There are nearly 25,000 old copies or parts of the Old and New Testament scriptures and museums around the world. Yet one of the most powerful evidences to the inspiration of the Bible and its accuracy is fulfilled prophecy, both Old and New Testament. There are approximately 300 prophecies concerning Jesus himself the Messiah, some of which have been presented earlier during these lovely four days with you. Anyone has the right to wonder why Uthman ordered the burning of all the copies of the Quran except Hafsa's three years, pardon me, 53 years after the so-called revelations began. 
How do you know that the Quran of today that you read is the same Quran which Muhammad recited? He had died 25 years earlier and was not around to verify Uthman's standard copy. Many of those who memorized it were killed at the Battle of Yamama, which was distributed throughout the Muslim world. Was it the real copy or not? To summarize this presentation, one must admit that overwhelming evidence from eyewitnesses, written documents, and ancient manuscripts verify that the Bible is indeed the word of God. We can trust it, believe it, read it, memorize it, share it with others, but most importantly, but most importantly, live by it to enjoy life and please the Heavenly Father. Quranic attempts at revealing who Jesus is. Upon probing and serious investigation of the Quranic text in Arabic, one is astounded how close some passages come to revealing the biblical Jesus. Despite the different name used for him, Isa instead of Jesus, still his personality and nature comes shining through in various surahs and verses. Surah 4, 171 tells us, The Messiah Jesus, son of Mary, was only a messenger of Allah, and his word which he conveyed unto Mary, and a spirit from him. إِنَّمَا الْمَسِيحُ عِيسَى إِبْنُ مَرْيَمْ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ وَكَلِمَتُهُ أَلْقَاهَا إِلَى مَرْيَمْ وَرُوحٌ مِّنْهُمْ We are told that Messiah Jesus is called son of Mary. Of course, that denotes his earthly relation to his godly and righteous mother, Mary. We are left to wonder, who is his father? However, he himself claimed that God was his father on numerous occasions. He also is called an apostle of God or a messenger. John's gospel relates to us time and again that Jesus was sent by God. John 8, 42. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God, nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. In this marvelous verse of Surah 4, 171, we are informed that Jesus is also the word of God. It is apparent that God and his word are one and the same. When we realize that the word was bestowed or conveyed to Mary, and when we understand fully what John 1.14 meant, then we connect the two together to one one John 1 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Thank you. Jesus is also called in the same Quranic passage a spirit from Him. Surprisingly, we notice here that since God is spirit, and Jesus is called spirit from God, we have to conclude that Jesus is truly the living God. We have now the understanding that these fantastic titles in the Quran match the Christian scripture in various obvious details. We do believe that Jesus is indeed the virgin born son of Mary, but also the Holy Spirit's conceived son of the highest. Luke 135. And the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Let us examine Surah 4251. And it was vouchsafed to any mortal that Allah should speak to him unless it be by revelation or from behind a veil. That he sendeth a messenger to reveal what he will be by his leave, though he is exalted wise. وما كان لبشر أن يكلمه الله إلا وحيا أو من وراء حجاب أو يرسل رسولا ويوحي بإذنه ما يشاء إنه علي حكيم Whether you understand Arabic or English It's very clear that this Quranic passage informs us that God communicates with human beings in three different ways It amazes me how close this passage sounds like Hebrews 1 and 1 and 2 God who at various times and various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets has in these last days spoken to us by his son whom he has appointed heir of all things through whom also he made the works. The three ways or methods God has used in the past are the following. God has spoken to the prophets through inspiring their minds so that they spoke the will and desire of God to their fellow men. In Surah 7, 117, we are told that God inspired Moses. God used messengers or angels on specific occasions to deliver his message to individuals. Surah 19, 17, 
Then we sent unto her our spirit, and it assumed for her the likeness of a perfect man. Abi's translation of this verse has it, we sent unto her our spirit that presented himself to her a man without fault. It's unfortunate that several translations use the word angel instead of that proper translation, our spirit, and as it's supposed to be, ruhana. The point is, if God is spirit, and he can appear as a perfect man in order to help Mary to understand God's message, why can he not become a man called Jesus? No one in human history lived a perfect life like Jesus did. Being a spirit from God would naturally present us with the perfection of his life and all detail. The third method or way God uses to communicate with us, human beings, is from behind the veil. Veil simply means anything which conceals or covers. The Bible explains that the veil God used was the body or the flesh of Jesus the Messiah. Here is Hebrews 10, 19 to 20. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated to us through the veil, that is, his flesh. To understand this incredible mystery, we read, Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. Why did the true and living God veil himself in flesh, in the person of Jesus the Messiah? There are two answers. First, it is for our protection. Second, to observe closely what God is like. It is no wonder that Jesus announced in John 14, 9, the following words. Have I been with you so long? And you two have not known me, Philip. He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you ask? Show us the Father. May I remind everyone that when the veil is lifted briefly on Mount Tabor, incredible things happen. Throughout the scripture, one observes that the appearance of an angel fear grips practically everybody. Exodus 33, 18 records that Moses said to God, please show me your glory. The answer in verse 20 is awesome. You cannot see my face, for no man shall see me and live. It is of great significance to take note of another occasion where the veil was briefly lifted in the garden and on the mountain. At any rate, here's the biblical record. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, who are you seeking? And you remember what happened, they fell backward and he said, I am. Finally, we must conclude very simply that from the above mentioned declarations, quotations and incidents that God can and does appear in human form or any form he wishes. Yet his greatest demonstration in communicating with mankind is neither nature nor angels, not even prophets, but it is Jesus, the Messiah, King of kings and Lord of lords. Why? Because he loves you. And he loves me and wants to love us back into his eternal family by simple childlike faith in his gift of salvation through his wonderful grace. I conclude, the honor of being children of God, which was lost in the Garden of Eden, is now restored to us from the Garden of Gethsemane. The first Adam fought the battle with Satan and lost, but Messiah Jesus, the second Adam, fought the battle and won. Therefore, by faith in Christ Jesus, his finished work on Calvary, we become new creatures and can belong to a new race of people, the spiritual and eternal family of God. The loving Father would like very much to tell you, one and all, welcome back home in the name of Jesus. God bless you and thank you. You still have that fire burning, huh? <laughs> okay, I'd now ask Shabir Ali to come and make his presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, I begin by praising the creator and the fashioner of the heavens and the earth and asking him to send peace and blessings upon all of his prophets and messengers and ask him to bless our meeting here tonight so that we can continue in good spirits Amen. to dialogue in friendship and love and understanding. Muslims and Christians together make up more than half of the world's population. And if Muslims can be better Muslims and Christians can be better Christians, certainly our world will be a better world. So the Quran tells us that we are going to have differences. Uh, theological matters will continue to be discussed. But the Quran tells us that we should discuss these matters in, uh, in good spirits, uh, in a way that is most gracious. And the Quran, in fact, assures us that these differences will not go away. So what are you to do then? Uh, leave the matters to God because he will be the final judge. And you yourself should race with each other in doing good things. 
So if Muslims did uh, uh, more good things than they've ever done, and Christians did more good things than they've ever done, then uh, we will have much more good in the world. At the same time, our faiths are important to us. We want to know something about the history of these faiths. We want to know what is true and what is not. Uh, more specifically, we want to know how these uh, faiths interact with each other. And I hope that uh, in tonight's uh, presentations, Dr. Shirosh and I will be helping you to sort out uh, some of these issues. Let me begin then by saying a few uh, words about the Quran. Why do Muslims believe that the Quran is the word of God? Now, we have to go back to the life of the Prophet Muhammad, uh, peace be upon him, who was born in the year 570. He lived in the clear light of history. At about the year uh, 610, when he was about 40 years old, he received an extraordinary experience. While he was meditating in a cave, uh, the Sira ibn Ishaq uh, relates to us, he was visited by the angel Gabriel. This is the same angel who had visited Mary in the Gospel according to Luke. And this angel then directed him to read. He protested, he didn't know what to read. But the angel gave him what to read. Ikra bismi rabbika ladhi khalaq. Uh, these words now uh, form the opening uh, of ch chapter 96 in the Quran. It says, read in the name of your Lord who created, created man from a thing that clings. Read and your Lord is most generous, who taught man by the pen, taught man that which he did not know. So he recited these words. And eventually, over the, the uh, following 22 to 23 years, for the rest of his life, the angel kept uh, impressing upon his mind further bits and pieces of inspired revelation in a variety of contexts and situations. All of these pieces eventually will be collected into the hearts of his followers by memorization, written down in available materials such as parchment, uh, such as stone and bone, uh, because paper, though already invented in China, uh, would not uh, by this time have reached Arabia. It would uh, become popular in Arabia in the second century of Islam. Now, uh, Dr. Shirosh made reference to Uthman, the uh, third caliph of Islam, uh, who reigned from the year 12 to 24. During his reign, uh, it is uh, widely accepted that he made a standard copy of the Quran. He collected all of the parchments, he consulted those who had memorized the Quran in the presence of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And though some had already died in the Battle of Yamama that Dr. Shirosh made reference to, nevertheless, there were people around, such as Zaid bin Thabit uh, and others who had memorized the Quran, uh, who then worked at preparing a standard copy that was then uh, produced into further copies and sent to various parts of the Muslim Empire. Today, the text of the Quran that we read is based on that initial text that Uthman uh, had uh, prepared. And this is by all counts, whether by Muslim historians or by non-Muslims uh, who do not necessarily have any reason to promote Islam. Uh, for example, Adrian Brockett, looking at some of the variant readings that uh, have arisen uh, between the uh, reading of Hafsan Asim, which is most popular in the Muslim world, and another reading from Barsh and Nafi, which is uh, more popular in the North African region, has pointed out that, in fact, the differences are quite insignificant. And uh, nothing in these readings point to any difference in theology or any deliberate change from any individual to promote one sort of belief or tendency or another. In fact, to give you some examples of the kinds of changes that have been noticed, we read, for example, in the first chapter of the Quran, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim Maliki Yawmiddin. Praise be to God, the Lord of the worlds, the beneficent, the merciful, Maliki Yawmiddin, which means owner of the day of judgment. Now, if instead of reading Maliki Yawmiddin with a long A, we read it Maliki Yawmiddin with a short A, then it would mean king of the day of judgment. Now, the most popular reading is Malik, which means uh, owner, and the less popular reading is Malik, which means king. But well, we can see here that this difference is insignificant because it is the Muslim belief that God is both king and owner of the Day of Judgment. In fact, uh, a student uh, of the Quran who has written a book, An Introduction to the Sciences of the Quran, published by Hidayah Publications in Birmingham in this country, has uh, rightly pointed out that in looking at the variant readings that have arisen over time, we can see in fact that God, in a, a providential manner, has allowed for these variety of readings to be read from the same skeleton text such that the meanings of the Quran become expanded with the variety of readings. 
And this is marvelous. So then what we have, and I should explain for our English speaking audience, is the fact that the Arabic that was used in writing at the time of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and even in the time of the third caliph, was such that it uh, did not include vowel markers. Now I know this may sound strange to English uh, readers because no English word is ever written without vowels. But Hebrew and Arabic, the Semitic languages, are written without vowels. Those who are trained in the reading of the text, knowing the grammatical rules, know how to fill in with a fair degree of accuracy what vowels belong to the text or not. Perhaps it is much the same as uh, in our use of abbreviations. We, ab we abbreviate don't and can't and won't and shouldn't. But if you were to spell these words out, we know exactly what words are to fill in there. Also, we use certain other abbreviations like LTD for limited and CO.LTD. And everyone looking at that reads it as company limited, even though all of the letters are not there. But you know the language. In a similar way, although all of the vowels were not marked in, those who were trained in the memory of the Quran, who those who had memorized the text and knew the language, used the writing as an aid to the memory. And so the main work was done from the memory uh, of the text. Moreover, to complicate the difficulty, initially, the letters, the consonants, were not distinguished one from another by the placement of dots as we have them now. And so, uh, you can have letters that look alike and are not distinguished. That may be compared to an English uh, writing, for example, in which the I's are not dotted and the T's are not crossed. If the I's are not dotted and the T's are not crossed, then in handwriting, the I and the T may look alike. In a similar way, there are look-alike Arabic letters that are distinguished one from another by the placement of dots, the number of dots, and where they are placed. This was not done initially. This must have contributed to some uh, degree of uncertainty among some people who were not uh, trained in the recitation of the text, especially new Muslims from new regions coming into Islam, and it was precisely this situation that led Uthman to take the drastic action of burning those copies of the Quran which were not written under the supervision of the initial companions of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, those who knew the text, knew how it was memorized, knew how it should be written, and knew how it should be read. By way of comparison for our Christian friends to understand, suppose we have a document produced under the consensus of the original 12 disciples of Jesus, well, the 11 plus Matthias, 12, inspired by the Holy Spirit, if we have a document from them, then anything else claim, claiming to be the gospel, but varying from that initial document, we would reject as being unworthy to be read in the churches. Our present-day historians would very much like to get their hands on such varied materials, because that is the stuff of history. But 1400 years ago, at the time when this was being done, the consideration was not so much to preserve the history, but to preserve the text. And so, the action of Uthman, though might sound surprising to a modern historian, was in fact quite reasonable in his day. So we have it then that the Quran, as we have it today, uh, is quite reasonably preserved, and uh, a Muslim does not um, have any reason for thinking that any word in the Quran is not uh, as it was left by the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Now, how do we explain the variations then? If it is read one way, it's the most popular reading in the world, and another way in the reading of uh, Warsha Nafia in North Africa, and there are some other variety of readings as well. In fact, Muslim scholars have listed uh, 10 famous readings. So then, what accounts for these variations? There are reports uh, attributed to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, saying that the Quran was revealed to him in a variety of, of modes, sabati ahruf, in seven modes. What exactly is meant by modes, the Muslim scholars have not been able to decide. But all of these reports go to say that even though people recited in a variety of ways, even more than seven, because in the Arabic language the word sab'a, or seven, 
can mean several, as our English word several. So even though individuals re recited in a variety of ways, if those ways can be linked back to the, rest, to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, as the authority from whom it comes, these varieties of ways are all sanctioned by God. In other words, then, we should not conceive of the Quran as revealed from God as a printed text from heaven that then gets reproduced and duplicated and so everybody has the same copy initially. We should think of the Quran as a revelation given to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that could be expressed in a variety of readings. Given such that through the providence of God, and mirrored by the careful actions of people to try to memorize the text, to note it down, to preserve it correctly, the text eventually will be preserved in a variety of readings, all of which express the same basic meaning and all of which link people back to God who is the original source of this revelation. That, of course, is not to say that every sort of reading is permissible and acceptable, and this is where the Muslim scholars worked uh, and labored to determine which are of the readings can be linked back to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, through an authentic and unbroken chain of authorities. Uh, just as uh, Dr. Shirosh spoke about the authorities that would have relayed the information from the past. So who knew what happened at creation? Methuselah lived for 967 years, so he would have informed Noah. And so Noah would inform eventually Abraham, and Abraham would, and so on, and so forth. So Muslim scholars wanted to make sure that if one recites the Quran in a particular way, that recitation could be traced back to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and that would then be considered authentic, it would be preserved. But then, if there is only one Quran in heaven, and Dr. Shirosh has asked about this uh, in the past. Do Muslims have two Qurans in heaven? Well, Muslims believe that God has written everything in what is called the preserved tablet. And this is not unique to belief in Islam. It's also there in Judaism. Uh, if you read the book by F.E. Peters entitled The Children of Abraham, this will be confirmed. So in the preserved tablet then, God has uh, written everything. There is a, an inkling of this in the book of Exodus where Moses says to God, blot me out of the book of life if you will not accept me as a substitute for these uh, people. In other words, Moses says, instead of punishing the Israelites, punish me instead. Blot me out of the book of life. And uh, God refused to do that. But the reference to the book of life is a reference to this preserved tablet. Muslims believe that from this preserved tablet, all of the scriptures are revealed including the Quran. But we should not think of the Quran being in the preserved tablets in a finished book the way it comes off our modern press. We should think of the preserved tablet as the knowledge of God, as it is related in the Tafsir of Ibn Kathir, that uh, God initially commanded the pen to write, and the pen asked, what should I write? And God said, write my knowledge. Now the knowledge of God, of the Quran, as it will be revealed to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and then recited by the Muslim scholars over time by accurate and, and continuous chains of uh, transmission, and then preserved in the famous readings, all of that providentially, we should believe, is already written in the preserved tablet. In other words, all of the possibilities, everything that could ever happen, are all written in the preserved tablet. This makes it possible then for God to be in full control because nothing happens except that which he has made possible. And at the same time for there to be human freedom and for there to be human responsibility which is the mirror of that human freedom. In other words then, with this conception of the Quran and its relation to the preserved tablet, we can say that all of these readings are in the preserved uh, tablet. People get confused because when they think about what's happening here, and they try to relate it to what's happening in the preserved tablet, they confuse the two views. But don't confuse them and you won't be confused. When you're looking at things through natural processes, then you observe the natural processes. If you want to understand the history of the preservation of the Quranic text, you study that history. If you want to think about the providence of God, then you think about the preserved tablet. But when you try to relate the two together, people get confused. How does this relate to that? When we talk about the knowledge of God, we are speaking about God who is by nature mysterious and his knowledge which is unfathomable. 
In sum then, the Quran that we're reading today, whether it's in the Hafs and Asim uh, popular reading, or whether it's from Barsha Nafia or Kaluna Nafia from the Sudan and other regions, or some other lesser known readings, all of these are strands of the same rope of God let down for humankind to hold on to. So the Quran then is said to be the Hablullah, the rope of God, by which we can hold on to, we can have a connection with our Creator God. It is His final divine message revealed to us so that human beings can find the way to be saved. Now, if that is the history of the revelation of the Quran then, to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and then to, uh, to be preserved over time, what gives Muslims the confidence that this book is really what it claims to be? The fact that it has been preserved is not sufficient to mean that it is a book from God. Human beings could have written it down. How do we know the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, himself did not write down this book, just expressing his own ideas and, and saying that this is the Word of God? Well, if we did not assume that the Quran is the Word of God, if we approached it from a reasonable person's perspective to see if perhaps there's any reason to believe it or any reason to disbelieve it. I think that there are many reasons for thinking that the Quran is the Word of God that we will discover. First, it would be unreasonable to think that the Prophet Muhammad wrote this book because the book claims again and again to be from God. And historians of the life of the Prophet Muhammad, such as William Montgomery Watt and Richard Bell, have said that the Prophet Muhammad must be taken as being sincere. Because this man lived for this message. And he spent his life preaching it. He refused the offers of his enemies to compromise. And he maintained this message even though he was being persecuted and his family and friends and followers were being persecuted. That shows his sincerity. And while his sincerity alone is not enough to prove that the word is from God, at least it gets us past the question, was he deliberately concocting it and lying to people to fool them? So we're past that. Second, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is called in the Quran, a Nabi Ummi. And Dr. Shirosh has said that this word can mean Gentile. And that's true. But it could also mean one who is close to his mother, meaning an unlettered person, meaning just like the child is uh, not trained to read or write, still in the lap of his mother, one who is called Ummi in Arabic uh, is, uh, is said to be unlettered. He's still in the lap of his mother so, long, so far as reading and writing is concerned. Uh, some time ago I heard Dr. Shirosh saying that Umm is not uh, in the classical Arabic, but uh, I'm sorry Dr. Shirosh it is. Do Walida and uh, is also there, but Um is also there, and we can tell that uh, from the usage in the Quran itself, which is a classical text. Um Mahatukum, for example, your mothers, and, and so on. Not in Palestine. Maybe not in Palestine. <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> Maybe not. You see, one has to distinguish between the colloquial spoken Arabics of uh, various regions and the classical standard Arabic, which is the language of uh, textbooks and magazines and uh, news broadcasts. Uh, there is one standard Arabic, and then there are a variety of spoken Arabic. Sometimes one who is familiar with the spoken Arabic may not uh, be quite clear on the usages in the classical Arabic, and vice versa. I am studying the classical Arabic as a student, and I couldn't speak uh, a word to my uh, Palestinian or other friends, because uh, if I speak to them, I will sound very strange and foreign. It's like someone speaking Shakespearean English today. Uh, but in, in, a, in a formal context, however, if we were in an educated gathering, we would have to speak formally. And if I were addressing a crowd in Arabic, I would have to address uh, formally in the standard classical Arabic tongue. Um, uh, as a matter of interest, uh, a, a tape was given to me of uh, Jesus of Nazareth, a tape I referred to previously by John Heyman. When Jesus speaks uh, ordinarily, he speaks uh, colloquial Egyptian Arabic, and that's interesting to see him do that. Um, but when he speaks formally, like when he addresses words from the Sermon on the Mount, for example, he speaks the formal standard Arabic. So in the formal standard Arabic, the word um and ummi are there, and ummi then means one who is on letter. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him then, uh, we believe, was uh, not trained to read or write. The Quran makes reference to the fact that the Prophet Muhammad is not uh, uh, writing the text with his own hand. 
Otherwise, those who, have, uh, 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 those who want to doubt may have reason to doubt. So we know then that he was not trained to read or write. Dr. Shirosh has expressed the, the concern that the Prophet Muhammad must have known how to read or write because he was a merchant. But merchants in the ancient days uh, were not necessarily literate. Though they could be very good with numbers and uh, you couldn't fool them when it comes to counting change, but uh, that doesn't mean that they could write um, necessarily. So that doesn't prove anything. The Treaty of Hudaybiyah, it is said, uh, uh, was signed by the Prophet Muhammad, uh, peace be upon him, when it was initially written up and said this is a treaty between the Quraysh, the non-believers, and uh, Muhammad, the Messenger of God. The others complained and said we couldn't agree to the treaty on those terms because if we recognize them as a prophet of God, we wouldn't be having the treaty to begin with. Right. So that has got to go. But the friends and followers, especially Ali, followers of the Prophet Muhammad, could not bear to strike out that item that expresses the Muslim belief in Muhammad. And then he asked to be shown where it is, and he struck it out with his own hand. And he wrote bin Abdullah, which means the son of Abdullah, that is his surname. Now that by itself is not evidence that he could compose a book or a scripture because uh, a person might be semi-literate, partly literate. The fact that a person is able to write his own name is not a proof that he could compose a letter or even a book. So we do not have any clear evidence then that the Prophet Muhammad was uh, literate in the sense that he could write and compose nor was he known among the persons who were uh, specializing in composing literature in his day. And so we have reason for thinking then that the Quran, which has become a classic masterpiece in the Arabic language, uh, was not really his doing. It was a revelation given to him from the Almighty God. Third, we can see that the Quran psychologically couldn't be from the mind of the Prophet Muhammad because it addresses him, it uh, commands him, on occasion even criticizes him for some of his actions. So then, that is an outside voice speaking to the Prophet Muhammad, impressed upon his mind. If we didn't take this view, we would have to say that he was somehow insane. But history knows him to be a very sane leader, a very able statesman and a general, uh, and a moral guide. So he was not insane. On the view that he was sane then, uh, this uh, is not from his own mind, but a revelation implanted in his mind, inspired by the Almighty God. Now sometimes it has been claimed that the Prophet Muhammad suffered from epilepsy. But this is an old uh, contribution from those who wanted to find some reason uh, to dismiss the Prophet Muhammad so you couldn't listen to him. But as uh, Thomas uh, Lipman pointed out in his book, uh, Understanding Islam, uh, and he quotes uh, Tor Andre regarding this, uh, it doesn't even matter. If the Prophet Muhammad, uh, even, even if we grant that he had a physical disability, that does not mean by itself that he could not be the, the recipient of a divine revelation. What do we have against people who have physical challenges? Nothing. But the fact of the matter is that the evidence based on which some people have claimed that the Prophet suffered from epilepsy is uh, very weak and meager. And in fact, those who have uh, looked at the evidence closely they find that the behavior of the Prophet, as described in the reports about when he received revelation, are, be are behaviors that are characteristic of an ecstatic Prophet, similar to the Prophets that are known from the Old Testament. Especially Isaiah, for example. Isaiah on one occasion walked naked, but the Prophet Muhammad never walked naked. The, 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 the very fact of the revelation from God the experience of a human being being in such close and direct communication with God was overwhelming to individuals, and Muslims understood this to be a mighty word. We shall reveal upon you a heavy word. And the reports say that when the Prophet Muhammad was under this divine uh, inspiration, his body became heavy. So if he sat on a camel, the camel was pressed downward. And on one occasion, his, uh, his uh, knee rested against the thigh of one of his friends. And the friend said, uh, and this was Zayd bin Thabit, he said, I felt that my thigh would break from the pressure of the Prophet's knee. But some people try to invent more than this and they try to say, okay, the Prophet Muhammad was uh, frothing in the mouth and falling on the floor and, and so on. They try to, first of all, concoct the kind of descriptions that would suit or match an epileptic person and then claim based on that concocted description that the Prophet Muhammad was epileptic, it shouldn't work that way. You have to have the evidence and then the conclusion. You cannot uh, construct the evidence 
in order to match the conclusion. So finally, we say from a psychological um, examination, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was a sane individual, and my third reason holds that since the Quran commands him and uh, on occasion even criticizes him, this is not his own work. Uh, fourth, the Quran tells us about past uh, history, and we see that uh, sometimes it relates things that were not known to Muhammad or his contemporaries. It is uh, true that there must be some things that the Prophet Muhammad knew before they came to be revealed in the Quran. But the Quran is also saying that there are some things which the Prophet Muhammad didn't know. As if a sudden burst of inspiration in his mind produced a certain idea, and that idea comes to be formed in a text, he recites that under divine inspiration, just like Dr. Shirosh said, that Peter said, and, and yes, I, I'm familiar with that verse, Dr. Shirosh, Peter said that no, uh, no scripture is by private interpretation because men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke. We believe that the similar circumstance happened with the Prophet Muhammad, so he was under divine inspiration. So the Quran says, for example, in Surah 11, verse number 49, This is uh, This is from the uh, revelation from the unseen that we reveal to you. Neither you nor your people knew it prior to this. So now, uh, for the Prophet Muhammad to include a statement like that in his book, he had to be doubly sure that none of his contemporaries, the Arabs to whom it is first addressed, are aware of this. Because somebody at the back of the room might say, but, uh, excuse me, wait a minute, hold on a sec, sir, uh, I'm already aware of that. How can you say we're not aware? Now, if the Prophet Muhammad were learning the contents of the Quran deliberately from some other individuals, either Jewish informers or some Christian friends or monks, or others, he would be an open charlatan. And he would stand very much the risk that some of his very informers might inform others of the same thing, and also inform others that he, they are the ones who are informing the Prophet Muhammad. He would not have dared to include something like this in his book, and that shows that in fact this is a revelation from God, daring to say something like this. Fifth, the Quran speaks about the future, telling us about things before they happen. And then we see the future turning out exactly as already declared in the Quran. For example, Surah 30, which says, Rome. The Romans have been uh, defeated in a nearby land, and within a few years they will turn out victorious. Now some have tried to say this is not really a prediction because you can read it the other way, Rome. But uh, that reading is not uh, attested, and the proper reading is Rome. Once we understand the proper reading then, we see that this is a prophecy that though the Romans have been defeated in the nearby land, within a few years, anywhere from three to nine, they will turn around and win a victory. And indeed, at the Battle of Issus in 622, the Romans did turn around and win a victory. So if you count the time from the revelation of this verse in the year 615 to 622, we have seven years, so it is within that time. Moreover, Heraclius penetrated into the Persian territory in a final and decisive manner in the year 624. So within the nine years, definitely there was a clear and supreme victory for the Romans. At a time that this was said, people could not imagine that the Romans would win that victory. They were so thoroughly defeated. That then shows that the Quran speaks about the future, and the future obeys the book. Who then could know the future except God alone? We see then this is evidence that the Quran is the word of God. Six. The Quran has descriptions about physical phenomena. Dr. Shirosh had said uh, that the Bible is not a book of science, and I agree that the Quran also is not a book of science. Dr. Shirosh has said that where the Bible touches upon things related to science, the statements are true. And I'd like to say also that where the Quran touches about statements regarding science, and I think this goes for both the Bible and the Quran, uh, for my first point here, that we should expect them we should expect the statements to be communicable to people at the time when they were written. Naturally, these books could not teach the modern theories about science, otherwise the initial listeners would be confused and they would have no reason to listen to this book because in the first place they'll find the message to be confusing. So the Quran uses terms and expressions that were known, that were understood that might convey an image in order to get across its main point. Its main point is that God is in control of everything and God subjected all of the physical uh, phenomena to you so that you can in turn worship God and have a loving relationship with Him. 
So it's not the point to teach science, but what we do notice, and I think this is unique to the Quran, it may be in the case of some Bible verses, but specifically so unique in the case of the Quran, that we have a wide variety of verses about a large number of physical phenomena, and when these phenomena are studied, we see that the verses seem to betray a knowledge of our modern understanding of these things. And that shows then that this is not simply a 7th century book written by a 7th century individual, but it looks more like a revelation from the Almighty God. For example, specifically, the Quran speaks about the growth and development of the human embryo, describing the very early stages. It says that, for example, the human embryo is developed from a thing that clings, as we learned from the first revelation that I mentioned previously, from Surah 96, and from Surah 23, verses 12 to 16. Today we know, for example, that when the embryo is 24 days old, it actually looks like a leech. And the Arabic word, which has been translated a thing that clings, can also be translated a clot of blood, and people would have understood that, but it could also mean a leech in Arabic. And it so turns out that the human embryo resembles in its outward appearance the leech, the bloodsucker. And in fact, it also acts like one because it, uh, it clings on to the uterine wall of the mother and it, it starts to derive the nutrients from the mother. What an excellent description of that initial stage of human growth. Furthermore, the Quran uh, then describes the next stage of growth, saying that the leech is turned into a mudra. A mudra in Arabic means a chewed lump. Dr. Keith Moore of the University of Toronto said he was surprised at this term and he took a plasticine model of the human embryo at 28 days old and he bit into it to form teeth marks and he saw that the teeth marks on the human embryo resembled closely the somites forming on the human embryo uh, at 28 days old. A remarkable description. Let me remind you that at 28 days old the human embryo is no larger than a grain of rice. Say whatever, basmati rice or whatever you like. <laughs> so that could not be studied without the help of an electron uh, microscope. And since the microscope was not invented until a full thousand years after the Quranic revelation, we shouldn't imagine that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was privy to the knowledge about this from any uh, human sources. And it looks like this is a revelation from the Almighty God. And this is a conclusion that Dr. Keith Moore himself arrived at. So too did Dr. T. V. N. Prasad from the University of Winnipeg in Manitoba, who is an expert in the field of embryology. These two scholars have written the textbooks which are studied uh, by students of the subject in universities throughout the Western world. So then, the Quran describes uh, physical phenomena and uh, we can see in that that uh, this is a revelation from the Almighty God. Seven. The Quran says that if this book had been from anyone other than God, you would have found therein much discrepancy. If they not pondered the Quran with care, if it had been from any other than God, they would have found therein much discrepancy. Surah 4, verse number 82. Now people have wasted their lives trying to find errors in the Quran, but nobody has come up with anything that is a genuine example of an error in the Quran. Although they have shown us many examples of their own misunderstanding of the text, but nothing of an error in the Quranic text. Now the Quran was revealed to the Prophet Muhammad over this period of 23 years in a variety of circumstances, commenting on situations as they arise. If anyone wrote a book like that, just relying on his memory, going about, and he makes a pronouncement, he makes another pronouncement, he would contradict himself over time. But we see that the Quran is remarkably free from uh, any sort of uh, contradiction or error. This then, we believe, is because it is a revelation from the Almighty God. And uh, eight, the Quran challenges people to produce a book like this, to prove that it can be done. Now it seems to me that this relates to the first point about the sincerity of Muhammad. The Quran seems to be saying to people, look, this man lived among you for so many years. You know him. He's an honest person. You call him Alameen, a sadiq, the truthful, the trustworthy one. Do you think it's really easy for somebody to come up with a book and say, look, this is revealed to me from God if it wasn't so? Uh, try it and see. C can you really, as a good, upright, moral person seeking religion, honest with yourself, sit down and write a book and say, God revealed this to me if it weren't so? So this seems to be the initial declaration. But over time, Muslims became aware that the Quran is more than just this. Just reading the text, one feels that this is a revelation from the Almighty God. 
not everybody has that feeling, but this might be the way in which the Quran itself is operating. يُدِلُّ بِهِ كَثِيرًا وَيَهْدِي بِهِ كَثِيرًا With this book, God will guide many and also leave many to go astray. So there will be two different responses, but the Muslim response is to say, كُلُّ مِنْ إِنْدِ رَبِّنَا All of this is from my Lord. We believe this to be from God. Moreover, we notice that in the structure of the Quran itself, there is reason to think that this uh, book is a revelation from the Almighty God. And now, this is my last point about the structure. And I'll say the ninth, this is my ninth point. Neil Robinson had pointed out that in fact when you look at the Quran in Surah 2, verse uh, number 143, you see that that is a pivotal verse in that chapter. And it says that uh, you Muslims have been made the mis midmost nation. It turns out that that verse, 143, is exactly at the midpoint of that chapter, which has 286 verses. And we only know that now, after the Quran had been memorized and written down and eventually put it, people put the verse numbers in, so then we can see how many verses are in a chapter. And now we know this to be the case. So how is this verse, speaking about Muslims being at the midmost nation, falling right in the middle of that uh, particular chapter? except by divine providence. We see then that God is working through the Quran in a very special way. Moreover, nowadays because we have the printed text, let's say of um, Hafsan Asim, which is the most popular text, if you were to go through this exercise yourself, list all of the chapters in the Quran, there are 114 of them, one all the way to 114, do it on a Microsoft Excel worksheet program. Then in the next column, list for each chapter how many verses there are and take your totals of the two columns. You will see that there are 6,236 verses in this text. Now, if you add up the chapter number with the number of verses in each chapter, you will get 114 results. 57 of those results are even numbers, and 57 are odd numbers, which is uh, um, surprising because it doesn't have to work out so evenly. Add up all of the even numbers, and you will see you get the total of the number of verses in the entire Quran, 6,236. And that came from only 57 chapters. What about the 57 odd numbers? If you add those up, you will get a grand total of 6,555. And that turns out, maybe some math students have already worked it out, that turns out to be the total of all of the chapter numbers in the entire Quran, 1 to 114. The formula for that is n into n plus 1 over 2. So then, uh, finally, how did this surprising result come out unless it is by divine providence? I say that this is a code that has been placed in the Quranic text so that when we discover it today, we will know that no one has changed this text over time. Because if you advance one chapter or retract it, you will see that your numbers will go all, all out of whack. We can see that it is there by divine providence and that is a further assurance that the Quran as we have it now is a revelation from the Almighty God. So folks, altogether I think I presented nine reasons to show that the Quran is a revelation from God and I would be very happy to see what Dr. Anish Shirosh uh, would have to say about this. Thank you very much. Okay, we're ready to resume. Could I ask you please to take your seats? I will invite Dr. Shirosh to, to respond. Dear friends, we come now to a very crucial and critical matter concerning the Quran. I'm hoping that you will understand that my purpose is to do what I shared with you initially, and that is to tell the truth in love. Some of you may have logged onto my website. It's called Islam-in-focus.com, and the word Islam acrostically spells out, I sincerely love all Muslims, and I do. Because of extra freedom of religion and expression, in the Western world, we are able to have discussions of this nature with open minds and gracious attitudes, and I hope one day in the rest of the Muslim countries. It has been my hope for 20 years and prayer. We're all the creation of God, and the object of his unconditional love. 
Therefore, we must ask the question, is it really possible that God Almighty, our Heavenly Father, will give us two books, supposedly inspired by Him, yet they contradict each other? First Corinthians 14, 33 informs us, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. It is inconceivable that God would seek to confuse us with misinformation, then infuse us with inspiration. The analytical research of the Quran does indeed demonstrate that the Quran has two major problems. Number one, first, it predicts the scripture which preceded it by over 2,000 years of recorded documents, both old, 1,500 years, new, 500 years close to 600. Our Muslim friends get very distressed with this discovery and end up with one response and one response only. The Bible is changed. The Bible has been corrupted. They have never produced any other copy of the Bible other than what we have in our hands to prove that. Besides, there has never been a conference in the history of the Jewish, neither the Christian religious leaders, in which such an effort was made. We also must ask, what is the motivation for changing the scripture? Think with me. When the Apostle Paul began his missionary journeys, time and again, the seekers for truth of what he was telling studied the scriptures to verify or nullify what he was saying. Second, upon closer scrutiny of the text of the Quran, one is extremely disappointed to find that the Quran contradicts itself in numerous surahs and passages. The Quranic problems which demonstrate the inescapable conclusion, the Quranic problems which demonstrate the inescapable conclusion that it is difficult to accept it as an inspired document with 10 basic issues. Number one, geographical mistakes, 12 of them. Historical mistakes, 55. Ethical mistakes, 9. Theological mistakes, 29. Linguistic mistakes, 25. Mistakes in civil laws, 26. Mistakes in social laws, 21. Scientific mistakes, 22. Mistakes of eloquence, 11. Mistakes of personal nature, 33. Neither time nor space will allow us to discuss all of these and probe every problem which faces us in our honest effort to research for the truth. And maybe one day we can do it. Just give us some so I can respond to them. Yeah. Therefore, we must leave it ourselves to one or three points of each category. First, geographical mistakes. The sun, 93 million miles away, according to Surah 18, 83 to 86, we're told sits in a muddy spring. Strange enough, Alexander the Great almost considered a prophet in the Quran, is supposed to have discovered this amazing secret. In Surah 65, 12, we read that Allah created seven heavens and seven earths. Scientists are yet to find the other six planet earths. Heaven found them. As for the seven heavens, the Bible tells us there are three, actually. The sky, atmosphere around us, the space where other planets and stars have their existence, and the third, which is the dwelling place of the Creator God. Second, historical mistakes. We are informed in Surah 20, 85 to 88 that a Samaritan fashioned a golden calf in the wilderness when the people returned to paganism. Samaria, ladies and gentlemen, the home of the Samaritans was not in existence at that time. The Samaritans themselves were a mixture of Jews and Assyrians which surfaced in the 8th century BC. The wilderness experience took place in the time of Moses, 1500 years BC. According to Surah 66, 12, Mary, the mother of Jesus, is depicted as the daughter of Imran and in Surah 19, 28, as the sister of Aaron. The book of Numbers 26, 59 tells you the name of Amram's wife was Jochebed, the daughter of Levi, who was born to Levi in Egypt, and to Amram she bore Aaron, Moses, and their sister Miriam. Muslim theologians try valiantly to explain the discrepancy over 1,500 years over the two Marys by stating that the title daughter of Aaron was signifying her honorable descendancy. However, Mary, the sister of Aaron and daughter of Imran, belongs to the tribe of Levi. Mary, the mother of Jesus, belonged to the tribe of Judah. 
Besides that Mary, the sister of Aaron, was never married or had any children. The confusing story is due to the fact that the Quranic reference was borrowed from a second century Egyptian apocryphal fable called the first gospel of the infancy of Jesus Christ. In fact, another matter relating to Mary, the mother of Jesus here giving birth under a palm tree, as we did in Surah 19, 22 to 26. The gospel of Luke 2, 1 to 20 clearly tells us, because it was taken by Dr. Luke from Mary, the mother of Jesus, that she gave birth in Bethlehem, as the prophets of the Old Testament had indicated, it took place in a stable and there were no palm trees. In Surah 17, 100 and 104, we are told that Moses performed nine miracles among the Egyptians. Whereas the Bible, preceding by 2,000 years, testified that there were 10 miracles. Moses himself was saved from the Nile River by the daughter of Pharaoh, not the wife of Pharaoh, as Surah 28, 29 tells us, because if it were so, then Moses would become the heir of the throne of Egypt. Finally, the far-fetched fantasy-filled fable that is found in Surah 349 relates that Jesus as a child fashioned out of clay the likeness of a bird then breathed into it and the bird flew away. As Christians we can rejoice in this incredible admittance of the Quran that Jesus was a creator. But the truth is the source of the story can be found in Thomas's gospel of the infancy of Jesus Christ an apocryphal fable from the second century AD. Ethical mistakes. According to Surah 865, killing becomes lawful to the God who said, Thou shalt not kill. O Prophet, exhort the believers to fight. Again in 484 we read, So fight, O Muhammad, in the way of Allah, and urge on the believers. The Arabic word means not only to fight, but to kill as well. There are many other verses which express the same philosophy, almost a hundred of them, forcing people to accept this religion by the sword. Jesus, the Messiah of God, taught his followers six centuries earlier to be peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God, to love their enemies and not to kill them. How is it that we go backwards in this serious ethical issue instead of higher standard? Indeed, polygamy, although practiced sometimes in the Old Testament, was never sanctioned, I repeat, never sanctioned, neither approved by God. Jesus reminded his people that God from the beginning created them one man for one woman. In Surah 4.3 we are told that a man can marry up to four wives besides as many concubines as he can afford. This would seem an open opportunity to fulfill the sexual drive for men only and destroy the beautiful plan of God for the family unit. It further degrades women by not treating them fairly and as much as a woman cannot have four husbands. Theological mistakes. The rejection of a sacrifice to cover our sins is obvious in Surah 431. We're erroneously informed that Allah will forgive our lesser sins if we avoid committing the gross evil sins. Allah tells even Muhammad in Surah 47, 19 to ask forgiveness for his sin. That seems to indicate that your wrong doing is removed simply for the asking. Is there a judge? You could call a fair judge in the history of the world who has ever let a thief go unpunished because the thief declared that he did not kill his victim. Crime and punishment are part of every civil law in the world. The justice of God demands payment for our sins. He is merciful, all right, but he is also a just God. This is where the cross of Calvary becomes the historical demonstration of God's justice and mercy at one point in history to say I'm sorry for my crimes is not enough in any court of law to be pronounced innocent. Somebody has to pay for the evil deed or the whole world will become chaotic. If the Quran is inspired, why is Muhammad challenged by Allah to seek approval from the people of the book of what he was supposed to have received? in Surah 1094. Apparently, Muhammad was not sure of the source of his inspiration. Therefore, he was to ask from the Jews and the Christians who are called the people of the book to verify the source of his inspiration. In Surah 19, verse 68 to 72, the Quran tells us that the devils and humans will be crouching in hell. But Allah will rescue those who were righteous and will leave the evildoers therein. It is true that the Bible states that hell was supposed to be prepared for the devil and his fallen angels. 
Sinners are offered eternal life rather than eternal hell whenever they repent of their sins and accept the salvation of God through Jesus the Messiah. How is it that the Quran destines everybody to hell? Then the righteous, whoever they are, will be rescued. We are not told where their next destination is. Linguistic mistakes. A masculine verb appears instead of a feminine verb in Surah 756. The mercy of Allah is considered a feminine verb because in the Semitic languages there is no neuter. Everything is either feminine or masculine. Arabic has singular, dual, and plural verbs. In this verse, the mercy of Allah is nigh, karibatun, not karibun. Karibun, singular, which is the masculine. In Surah 48, 8 to 9, we observe a mixed up sentence as to who is to be honored and worshipped. Really mixed up. Look, we have sent thee, O Muhammad, as a witness and a bearer of good tidings and a warner. Notice that ye may believe in Allah and his messenger and may honor him and may revere him and may glorify him at early dawn and at the close of day. If the statements of honor, respect, and glorification are referring to Muhammad, it would sound blasphemous, wouldn't it? Praise and glory belong to God only. Mistakes in civil laws. In Surah 538, the male thief and the female thief are to have their hands cut off. This inhumane treatment is against even logical reasoning. This custom, which was borrowed from paganism, causes the victim to become a major burden to society even after they repent of their evil. How can one make a living in that shape? Where is the merciful and compassionate Allah? Surah 434 elevates men over women. So does 2, 2 to 8. Yet the New Testament equates men and women in the sight of God. Most advanced societies are the ones who have given women equal rights as men in every field of endeavor. 7. Mistakes in social laws. In Surah 282, Instruction demands that in a court of law there must be two female witnesses whenever facing a male witness. Is it fair that a woman should be considered half the witness of a man? In Surah 16:126, Muslims are encouraged to take vengeance against those who mistreated them. One must ask, does taking vengeance improve humanity or help keep the peace among men? Jesus Messiah proclaimed in Matthew 6, 26, 52, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Furthermore, he admonished his followers in Luke 17, 4, that if your brother sins against you 70 times, 7 times, in one day you should still forgive him. Scientific mistakes. Surah 7, 148 tells us that the golden calf, which the Israelites fashioned in the wilderness, made a lowing sound. How can a metal object with no life in it at the time in history where they had no electronic knowledge like today produced the sound of a calf. In Surah 27, 20 to 28, one is astonished that the counselors of King Solomon included birds and jinns. A certain bird, called Hudhud in Arabic, Hopi, is presented as a philosopher who travels between the Queen of Sheba, the King of Solomon, over a thousand miles, decries the worship of idols and praises the worship of the one God. The Quran also claims that the jinns, human beings, and birds were soldiers in the army of King Solomon. In fact, one is very surprised to find an entire surah in the Quran entitled Al-Jinn. The language of the chapter matches the language of the rest of the Quran despite the statements being expressed by the jinn. What happens to logic and human reasoning whenever one tries to make sense out of this? Mistakes of eloquence. Contradiction in the Quranic statements is very prevalent throughout the text. Surah 1827 declares that there is none who can change the words of Allah. Yet in Surah 2106, Allah himself states that whenever he abrogates any verse, he will bring forth a better one or one like it. Do we have two Qurans in heaven? When Muhammad remember when he forgot? In Surah 1339, Allah states that he simply erases whatever he wishes, establishes whatever verses he wishes, and he has the mother of the book. In contradiction to these claims, the Bible asserts that heaven and earth may pass away, but the word of God stands forever. In Surah 87, 18 to 19, we find, Lo, this is the former scrolls, the books of Abraham and Moses. Actually, the Arabic translation would be more accurate in this manner. The above-mentioned truths are found in the earlier scriptures, the scriptures of Abraham and Moses. These two verses comprise a definite confession that the Quran was borrowed from the Bible. My personal research 
has revealed that Muhammad actually tried to interpret and summarize the Bible into Arabic since the Arabs had no holy scriptures. Had there been a translation of the Old and New Testament, Muhammad would have been a great evangelist. From Genesis, the Quran borrowed the stories of creation, Adam, Eve, Cain, and Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Lot, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. From Exodus, the Quran borrowed stories of Moses, Pharaoh, the pillar of a cloud, manna and quails, the Ten Commandments, the golden calf, and the Ark of the Covenant. From, Levit from Leviticus, the Quran borrowed the idea of an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth, and sacrificial offerings. From Numbers, the Quran borrowed the stories of the spies who went to the promised land, the red heifer, and Balaam the prophet. From Deuteronomy, the Quran borrowed the information that Moses wrote the Torah, and the priests were guarding it. From Joshua, the Quran borrowed the story of the children of Israel possessing the promised land. From Judges, the Quran borrowed the story of Gideon. From First and Second Samuel, the Quran borrowed the stories of King Saul, David, Goliath, and the repentance of David. From Kings and Chronicles, the Quran borrowed the stories of Solomon, the Queen of Sheba, Elijah, Elisha, and the captivity of Israel to Babylon. From Job, the Quran borrowed the story of Job. From Psalms, as well as Isaiah and Ezekiel, the Quran borrowed numerous verses. From Jonah, the Quran borrowed the story of Jonah. From the Gospels, the Quran borrowed the story of Zechariah. There is further evidence that numerous New Testament verses from Romans, Corinthians, and others were borrowed. The Quran admits in many passages, 131 of them to be exact, to the reference to the law of Moses, the Old Testament, and the Gospels. Are my friends, Muslim friends, surprised at hearing all of this? I still maintain what I shared in London 85, that most of the Quran is borrowed from the Bible. We must acknowledge that the mighty man from Mecca was eager to educate his illiterate Arab tribesmen about the wonderful words of God. We are very grateful that the time has come for us to meet on common ground and search for the truth, which is revealed in the original documents where we find the source of the Quran. It is eminently important for human beings throughout the world in this age of enlightenment to search for the truth and satisfy the longing within their hearts for peace with God, to accept his revelation in the person of Jesus the Christ. Read the Bible as I have read the Quran, you will find the sources, most of the sources of the Quran. Thank you and God bless you. Thank you very much. Are we ready to continue? Okay. I invite Shabir to respond. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sharosh, for giving me things to think about. I had uh, deliberately, in my opening presentation, refrained from any comments uh, that would um, reflect negatively on the Christian side. And uh, now that Dr. Sharosh has, uh, in fact, opened up uh, a discussion of a different sort, I will, in fact, uh, have to respond. Now, two books that contradict each other, the Bible and the Quran. God is not the author of confusion. Right. Of course, the Muslim will say the Quran is right and the Bible has been changed. Yeah. Where exactly? Last night, we demonstrated that Dr. Sharosh is using a Bible, which, in fact, has 1 John chapter 5, verse number 7. And this verse is the closest expression you will get to the expression of the Trinity. For it says that there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and these three are one. And this verse, in fact, turns out to be a later forgery. But uh, many have refused to surrender the Bibles that contain this forgery, although Dr. Sharosh had previously admitted that this is a later insertion into the Bible. There are many other Bibles which, does not contain, which do not contain that verse, but Dr. Sharosh should explain why he keeps to using the one that contains the forgery. So two books that contradict each other. Yes, God is not the author of confusion. He's revealed the Quran to show us the way forward, how to proceed. The true guidance is restated in the Quran. Now, are there... Um, uh, problems with um, the Quran contradicting itself? I think not. What about geographic? Does the Quran say that the sun sets in a muddy spring? Dr. Shirosh knows Arabic. It says that this figure, uh, he found it setting in a muddy spring, which means it is being described from the point of view of the one who witnesses it. That's how it appears to him. If we ask you, how do you find Glasgow? That is an opinion. How, how does it seem to you? And now it seems to me great, but somebody else may have a different opinion, and I would beg to differ with him. Uh, does the Quran say Alexander the Great? Uh, often uh, our friends uh, look at the Quranic commentaries, and they point to problems which are there in the commentaries, but I'm very glad that these problems are not in the text itself. The Quran does not say Alexander the Great. It doesn't name that figure. 
If the uh, Quran says that there are seven heavens and the Bible says three, perhaps the Quran is a better revelation about how many heavens there are. In any case, we're speaking here about whether three or seven, we start to go into the domain of God and how do you know that you're describing science there? We're not dealing with science. But he does ask, uh, how many earths are there? Well, today, you know, scientists are still discovering how many Earths are there. It is thought that, in fact, there might be numerous Earths. And again, when the Quran says seven, uh, we should take that as uh, a number not limited to seven, but uh, a number meaning several. Are there historical mistakes in the Quran? I don't think so. The Samaritan, uh, Dr. Shirosh is going by, uh, lay, by information which has now been disproved. The Interpreter's Dictionary of the Bible says that although it was long believed that Samaritans only came into existence after the sacking of Nebuchadnezzar in the year 722, in fact, the Samaritans themselves maintain a tradition that they go all the way back to Joseph. And in that case, they were in the time of Moses. Is their tradition reliable? Not entirely. But also, the other tradition, which comes from Judah, which uh, wanted to smear the Samaritans, is not reliable either. The truth is in between, says the, uh, the, uh, the Bible Dictionary, Interpreter's Bible Dictionary. And uh, by looking at the truth in between, we have some assurance that the Samaritans did exist in the time of Moses, and therefore the Quran is not here in a historical error. I think, Dr. Shirosh, you have to update your information. Now, when the Quran says sister of Aaron, is that a mistake? Dr. Shirosh thinks it is a mistake because she, he thinks they have the proper genealogy of Mary in the New Testament. But folks, if you read the genealogy that are given of Jesus, both in Matthew and in Luke's Gospels, you will find that there are several mistakes in these uh, two genealogies. In fact, uh, I was just reading a book on my way here which counted 17 errors in Matthew's uh, genealogy alone. We do not have in these genealogies any reason for being content with the way it is put forward. For example, in Matthew's genealogy, it, uh, it says that there are 14 generations from David to the Babylonian exile, and then 14 of the next uh, section of, uh, uh, f f and then 14 more. So three sections of 14 generations each. If you count the third section, you'll find there are only 13 generations. So one has slipped out, perhaps because of a copyist error, but it does show you cannot rely on the Bible as it is. You show me the 14, I'll be happy. Uh, so, so something is missing there. It is, uh, it is incorrect. Moreover, Matthew has deliberately uh, coined the, the, the list such as to make 14, 14, and 14. Why? Because he's going by the Arabic Jumal system, which is known from Hebrews uh, already, that, uh, known from the Hebrews, where you have each letter assigned a certain numeric value. So David's name amounts to 14. It's Dawood. Dal 4, uh, Wow 6, and Dal 4. So 6 plus 4 plus 4 is 14. Because David's name amounts to 14, Matthew deliberately structures the narrative to give 14, 14, and 14 for his own symbolic purposes. But in doing that, he has omitted many names in between in order to, uh, to telescope them to 14. We do not have here an accurate genealogy that we can depend on, and we cannot say on the basis of this that uh, Mary could not have been the sister of Aaron. In fact, in Luke's gospel, it says that she was a cousin of Elizabeth, who is called the daughter of Aaron. So probably she does come from Levite stock. Uh, previously, Dr. Shiro said that uh, Jesus was both prophet and messiah and also king. But in fact, if he was from David, yes, he has to be king, but in fact, he was never king. He was never king, Dr. Shirosh. So if you think he is king somewhere else, well, historically, he's disproven as a king. And if the Gospels go out of their way to present him as the son of David, they have to show that he was a king. And if he wasn't a king, that means he was a false son of David. He was the false Messiah on that claim. You see, the Gospels, in fact, have made a mess of the Messiah. How could Mary be the sister of Aaron? Uh, very simply, by being from that descent, uh, and known to be a very pious person from the priestly stock, people are saying to her, how can you come with a child? And uh, it looks like you got this by illegitimate means. Oh, you sister of Aaron, your mother was not a harlot, your father was not a wicked man, explain yourself. So that's the whole point. So she's called sister of Aaron, not meaning that she's a sister of that Aaron who lived uh, so many th uh, uh, thousands or hundreds of years ago, but she is by spiritual connection, sister of Aaron. Did she give birth under a palm tree? Possibly. That's what the Quran says, and I believe it. Should I say that the Quran is wrong because the gospel says she gave birth in the manger? In fact, historians do not give credence to Luke's record. Luke says that this occurred when Caesar Augustus uh, demanded a census. But historians 
historians think that no census was demanded during the time of Caesar Augustus. And as uh, the science writer Isaac Asimov uh, pointed out in his commentary on the Bible, uh, in, in volume two dealing with the New Testament, he says that even if they did uh, require a, a census, you wouldn't require everyone to go back to his hometown, the way it is described in Luke's Gospel. Imagine that the authorities want to collect taxes. They want to know where you live. So they want you to register where you live so they can come and find you. They don't want you to go register where you were born so then after you register you can go your own way then they wouldn't find you to collect the taxes. So the whole story is illogical. But why did Luke give us this illogical story? According to historians, and this is widely accepted now, both Luke and Matthew have a problem. Jesus is known to be from the hometown of my friend Dr. Sharosh. He's Jesus of Nazareth. But the prophecy in Micah says that the Messiah must be born in Bethlehem. Now you have a problem. Let's get him born in Bethlehem. So the two gospel writers construct two different fictive narratives to place him in Bethlehem for the birth. <laughs> Matthew starts in Bethlehem and then ends up at Nazareth. Luke starts at Nazareth and comes to Bethlehem and then goes back. But if you look at the narratives, you see that they do not agree, and historians widely accept this, that these are two fictive narratives constructed to or in order to try and prove the prophecy. So I think, yes, he, he must have been born under the palm tree, just like the Quran says. I have very good reasons for thinking the Quran to be the word of God, and I've uh, outlined those reasons as very reasonable ones. Now, so if the Quran says nine miracles and the Bible says ten, I believe the Quran. Moses performed nine miracles. You say ten, okay, one more. So, okay, I give you that one. Does the Quran say only nine? <laughs> Does the Quran say only nine? No. So maybe ten, maybe twelve, doesn't matter. Thanks. Now, it, so if the Bible says that uh, this was the daughter of Pharaoh and the Quran says the wife of Pharaoh, again, we don't have any independent way of establishing which is correct and which is wrong. But by looking at the two books over time and seeing the kinds of narratives that have fallen into the Bible, the unreliableness of the, of the very narratives, such as Luke's and Matthew's fictive narratives, uh, we can put more confidence in the Quran. What about Jesus uh, constructing or creating something from the likeness, uh, from clay, the likeness of a bird? Th does that prove that Jesus is creator? No, because it says, it is by the power of God that Jesus is doing these things. In fact, this accords with the Gospels too, because it says, it's by the finger of God that I cast out devils. Another narrative says, it's by the spirit of God that I do it. Jesus says, even in the Gospel according to John, which has the most developed theology, by my own self I can do nothing nothing. So he does it by the uh, leave and absence of God. Now what if this story resembles the story from an infancy gospel? It doesn't make any difference because no one is to say that all of the truth about Jesus is only in the Bible. That doesn't mean that the infancy gospels which are from the second century are entirely true or more reliable on, in the Bible, uh, than the Bible in general. But it is possible that some of their narratives might in fact be more reliable than some of the narratives in the Bible. Especially when we're dealing here with something that is not even stated in the Bible. We do not really have any room for contention because the Gospel according to John put it plainly. The Bible does not record everything that happened in the life of Jesus. Moreover, when you compare the two narratives, you will see that the Quran is not borrowing and taking a wholesale from sources like this, but you can say the Quran is correcting. In the, uh, in the infancy Gospel, you find that... Uh, if you read that yourself, you will see how the Quran has improved upon it. Because in infancy gospel, Jesus blows unto them and they actually become birds and they fly away. But in the Quranic narrative, it just barely says that Jesus fashions out of clay the likeness of a bird. We don't know what that is. It may not be a bird. It's something like a bird, like the shape of a bird. And then he blows on it and then it becomes tired and it becomes a bird by the help of Allah. Now what might have been called a bird and what was his demonstration? Did he make something like a plane and throw it uh, and breathe on it as one might blow a kiss and say, look, I have done something special, amazing, something that no one has done before? All of these are left for interpretation. But the Quran allows for reasonable interpretations, but that, that narrative from the infancy gospel does not. This shows that the Quran is not just simply taking from sources, but the Quran is using materials which are already available, already known, but in dialectic uh, uh, attention with uh, the listeners, Quran is saying, you know that, well conclude this. The conclusions are important, not what they already know. Does the Quran have ethical problems? The Quran says fight and kill. 
But Dr. Shirosh, you should be aware that the Bible says that too. In fact, I'm not aware that any book other than the Bible has such vicious verses. In the introduction, well, okay, you admit, Old Testament. Okay, so it's in your Bible, in the Old Testament. Old Testament is part of your Bible, true? True. So the same God, yes? But so the same God that was so vicious in the Old Testament is mildly vicious in the Quran. So you, you're fine with that? No. No? Okay. <laughs> so you want to have your vicious God and keep him to yourself? You don't want the Quran to have it? Uh, on the other hand, on the other hand, what you find in the Quran is, in fact, uh, instructions on how the Muslims should deal with those who are trying to attack the Muslims. So, for example, uh, Surah 22, verses number 39 and 40 says, uh, Permission is given to those who are being attacked for them to fight back because Allah is able to help them. And uh, these people, it goes on to describe these people, uh, the, the rationale is given. These are the people who have been driven out of their homes for no just reason except that they said our Lord is Allah. And then a further justification. If it had not been that Allah used some people to drive back the attackers, then the mosques, the synagogues, the churches, and uh, the, uh, the monasteries would uh, be demolished. So in other words, the Quran is telling Muslims that they should take up arms in order to defend religious freedom. So that not only Muslims but Jews and Christians could have the freedom to worship in their places of worship and these places should not be demolished uh, by uh, invaders and attackers. What about polygamy? Does the Bible say in any place that polygamy is prohibited? The Bible shows a Solomon to be an inspired person because he, pr he produces works which are inspired texts of the Bible, such as Proverbs and Song of Solomon. And the Bible also tells us that he had 700 wives and 300 concubines. So he had a thousand women. The number is obviously grossly exaggerated, but nevertheless, this is one of the inspired persons. So Dr. Shirosh wants to find some reason to dismiss the Quran and the teachings of Islam and the Prophet of Islam. This obviously is not a reason. Why was the same leverage not given to women in the past? Because uh, in the past, uh, women did not demand this. Uh, the, the privilege to marry many women, in fact, was also a responsibility for men to take care of them. And uh, if a woman had to marry many men, it means she had to bear uh, children for this one and that one and the other one. They would just become baby-making machines. So it worked well one way, but not the other way. It worked well one way that a man could be a uh, father of the children who are born to him from many wives. But if a woman were to bear children from many husbands, there will be discrepancies as to claims as to who are, is the father of a particular child. So it worked one way and not the other. It doesn't mean that this has to remain forever. The Quran in Surah 4, verse number 3 says, وَإِنْ خِفْتُمْ أَلَّا تُخْسِتُوا فِي الْيَتَامَ and so on. So it says, if you fear, you will not do justice to the orphans. So this was a conditional uh, thing given for the Muslims that if the orphans are there to be taken care of and the welfare system is not set up to look after the single mothers, one way of taking care of them and their children is to marry them. And this was a noble thing. The Muslims were encouraged. And then it was said to them in the same verse, if you fear you will not do justice to the situation, then marry only one. And that is best so that you can do justice. And uh, that to me is a reasonable uh, recommendation. Are there theological problems in the Quran? What about forgiveness? Well, yes, Dr. Shirosh, uh, God can forgive. And I don't know of any judge, and you can tell us a judge, who would... Uh, uh, kill an innocent person in order to let the guilty ones go free. What you are describing of God, in fact, shows God to be unjust. And I think that is not uh, the right way to proceed for believers. Now, why does Muhammad need approval from the people of the book? Well, because they knew what the revelation is about. So Muhammad is told, if you are in any doubt, ask them. But he didn't ask them because he was not in any doubt. What's wrong with asking the experts? You said you're the experts in what is revelation. What if Muhammad asked them, how does prophecy come to an individual? Now, of course, we don't have to ask them because we know from independent studies, we can study the Bible and see how prophecy came to individuals, how men moved by the Spirit spoke over time. And we can see that Muhammad fits that uh, pattern very nicely. Does the Quran say everybody will go to hell? It says, wa im minkum illa wariduha. Wariduha means you will pass over it. Muslims believe that you'll pass over the bridge of, of Sirat, over the hell. But of course, those who have done well will be rescued by God and put
pulled over uh, the, the bridge in the twinkling of an eye. So I think Dr. Shirosh has misunderstood that passage of the Quran. If we were to go through this uh, list of Dr. Shirosh one after another, I haven't gone through the entire thing because it's easy to read rapid fire 100 miles a minute, but, and it's more difficult now to deal with the problems once they are raised. But we have very good answers for all of these problems, as you can see, one after another. And God willing, before the night is over, we will uh, deal with them one after another. Thank you. Okay, I'd invite Dr. Shorosh to respond again. A second rebuttal. so many of you here tonight thank you from the bottom of my heart I hold in my hand a copy of an extra chapter in the Quran of the Muslims of Iran I leave it for my friend to explain to you that later I hold in my hand the Quran and it states here verily we created man from an extract of clay and then Notice how he brings it up to our 21st century. It is not in the original. Then we placed him as a drop of sperm, a safe depository. The fact is, the word notfa and ala have nothing to do with our scientific explanations or figuring out. And a babe is not a skeleton. You better see the aborted babies, see what they look like when they are not completed. Now, I hold in my hand what is the Quran? January 1999. 35,000 documents, fragments, at the great mosque in Sana'a, discovered in 1971, that have been studied by German scholars and have taken 32,000 microfilm pictures, providing evidence that these documents from the 8th to the 12th century, Qurans, Prove that the Quran has developed over the centuries and it is not the same as in the hands of the people today. And I think you already have that, knowing how intelligent and sharp you are. Thank you. And one of these days, I trust you will come and find not only the possibility of feeding at the fountain of atheists and agnostics of the Bible, but the believers in the Bible, like me, and come to be with me and we can evangelize the world. Amen. <laughs> now, Jesus in the Quran, a man of peace, a perfect man, apostle, messenger, a spirit from God, a word from God, a word of truth, an example, bearer of wisdom, the chaste, highly honored, giver of good tidings, knowledge of the hour, knowledge in scripture, like of Adam, Messiah, mercy from us, miracle worker, noble, lordly, one of the righteous, mina salihin bil Arabi one of the closest to God, prophet, revelation to mankind, servant of God, sign to all beings, sign of the hour, son of Mary, the blessed one, the favored one, the faultless son, the one confirmed, strengthened with the Holy Spirit, the one to be followed, the one to be obeyed, the truth from your Lord, witness on resurrection day, witness over the people. How do you like that? That's all from the Quran. We have the verses, and the references from both the scripture of the Bible as well as the Quranic references. Now, we have as part of our presentation tonight, the Bible and Jesus versus the Quran and Muhammad. I'd like to say to you with all respect for Muhammad, an Arab like I am, for my roots come from Saudi Arabia, I don't know that many of you know that. The fact is, if he were a candle lighting your night, Jesus is the sun that lights our world. Remember that. So I do not believe I can actually 
compare Muhammad to Jesus and vice versa. We can contrast them. I would suggest you compare Muhammad to Moses more. His name means Savior. Muhammad's name means praised one. Jesus, born of the Virgin Mary. Muhammad, born of Amina. Jesus, no earthly father. Muhammad, Abdullah was his father. Jesus, born about 4 BC in Bethlehem. Muhammad, born AD 570 in Mecca. Raised by Mary, his mother, and Joseph, his adop adopted father. Muhammad, raised by his mother, Halima, the nurse, then his uncle and grandfather. Labored as a carpenter in Nazareth. Muhammad started as a shepherd, then became a camel caravan leader. Spoke in Hebrew, Aramaic, and probably Greek. Muhammad spoke Arabic, and I believe, as of my latest research, he knew Hebrew and probably translated much of the Hebrew text into Arabic. That's why we have the statement always, so many times, a Quran in Arabic, because we have two Qurans, the Hebrew and the Greek. Was literate, wrote no books. That was Jesus. Muhammad was literate and wrote the Quran. Attracted multitudes by his miracles and teachings. Attracted multitudes by his teachings and the sword. Or else why there are 66 battles in the last 10 years of his life. I don't know of no general in history who fought 66 battles in 10 years. How to move to Capernaum. Had to move to Capernaum because of rejection by his townspeople. Muhammad had to move to Medina because of rejection by his townspeople. Was never married. Married to 15 wives. Lived a sinless life. Did not pray for forgiveness of sins but forgive others. Prayed earnestly and frequently, Muhammad did for forgiveness of his sins, according to 47, 19 and several other passages. Jesus waged no war. Muhammad waged many wars. Ordered the death of no one. According to history and hadith, he ordered the death of many men. The first was a poetess. Established a religion of mercy and love even for enemies. Established a religion of not much mercy and the sword. Established a spiritual kingdom. Establish an earthly empire. Died by crucifixion in Jerusalem at age 33. Died in Medina due to effects of pneumonia and poisoning at age 62. Arose the third day emptying his tomb. Muhammad lingers still in his grave awaiting the day of judgment when Jesus will be the judge of the living and the dead. Old Testament predicted his coming. No scripture predicted his coming whatsoever. Mentioned in the Quran 97 times. Mentioned in the Quran only 25 times by name. Over two billion claimed to be his followers. Over one billion claimed to be his followers. Many of his followers are known for the dedication, love, caring, and compassion for others. Unfortunately, these days, a number are known for the opposite. Jesus, the Messiah, is spoken of as Alpha and Omega. Muhammad is spoken of as a messenger. Jesus, a man. Muhammad, a preacher. Jesus, ancient of days, Muhammad, a warner. Jesus, bread of life, Muhammad, son of Abdullah. Jesus, conqueror, Muhammad, evangelist. Jesus, counselor, Muhammad, an apostle. Jesus, David's son, Muhammad, illiterate prophet. Jesus, door to heaven, Muhammad, a poet. Jesus, day spring, eternal life, friend of sinners, first and last, God, our savior, good shepherd, Holy One of God, hope of glory, I am, image of the invisible God, judge of the living and the dead, king eternal, life, light, living bread, Lord, mediator, Messiah, mighty God, only begotten of the Father, our Passover, our peace, prince of peace, prophet, priest, redeemer, righteous judge, rose of Sharon, savior, second Adam, son of God, son of man, teacher from God, truth and grace, unspeakable gift, Way, word of God, word made flesh. I trust that in the coming opportunity when we have a chance to answer your questions, we'll be glad to elaborate on some of these matters. But once again, I remind you, Jesus declared, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. And now, with this just one minute left, let me share with you what I believe. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for all Muslims is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone. But what does it say? The word is near you. 
even in your mouth, the word of God which we preach, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes to righteousness, and with mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. Hallelujah. Thank you very much. Now, as for this extra surah that Dr. Shirosh is putting forward, no historian give, gives uh, credit uh, to the claim now that Shias had an extra surah of the Quran. In some of the Shia books from old, they have claimed that there were extra surahs which the Sunnis omitted because these surahs uh, approved of the Caliphate of Ali, but that was uh, long discounted by historians as a political claim from that side with no historical validity whatsoever. The Quran, as Adrian Brockett and others have uh, pointed out, uh, has been from the time of the Caliph Uthman to now unchanged and no, nothing has been omitted. Um, William Montgomery Watt, uh, in his uh, introduction to the Quran, uh, has uh, put it nicely when he said, nothing that was included could have been included if it did not deserve inclusion, and nothing that was excluded could have been excluded if it de deserved inclusion. It was done so openly and publicly that uh, we can be assured that we have all and only the material of the Quran. As Paul would have said, it wasn't done in a corner. Now, what about this extract from play? Dr. Sharosh, I cited known medical experts in the field. You cannot just simply give your opinion and hope to cancel the opinion of medical experts, otherwise we'll come to you for the next doctor's visit. Uh, what about the Quran uh, uh, discoveries from Sana'a? Well, I have read this article and I've also read uh, uh, Pewin's uh, uh, own writing on the subject. And although it has been uh, so blown out of proportion by Toby Lester in this Atlantic Monthly article, uh, Pewin himself makes very modest claims. There is nothing in Pewin's writings that show that the Quran as we have it now is not uh, an original text or it does not link it, its way all the way to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Certainly this the document discovered, the documents discovered give us earlier copies than we ever had before and that is favorable to Muslims because it shows that the Quran existed as a, as a literary document uh, at a time when others have uh, doubted that it existed, for example John Wansborough. And although I answered this problem a couple of nights back, we still find Dr. Shirosh mentioning it again. Same with the 66 battles. If you count the battles in which the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, personally participated, there were only few. But the early historians tried to include everything, even spy missions, in which the Prophet Muhammad did not participate, all of those uh, they counted as his battles as well. But that, of course, is not the proper uh, reading. Muhammad knew Hebrew. Dr. Shirosh, give us, give, us, give us a break. Tell us, I am. <laughs> give us, give us a historian who has actually said that. And over the last uh, few debates, you've said a number of things. I've asked you for historians. You have not provided any. That's your opinion, and it's a faulty one. Uh, the prophet uh, Jesus was sinless, you say. But did you actually read your Bible? Now, I believe that Jesus was sinless because that is a Muslim belief about all of the prophets. But the Gospel according to John gives us a different uh, impression. Because the Gospel according to John, while intending to present Jesus in a high Christology, has actually slipped up in one place. Because in chapter 7, we have the brothers of Jesus telling him to go up to the feast. And Jesus says in verse number 8, you go up to the feast. I'm not going up to this feast because my time has not yet been fulfilled. After he had said this, he stayed on in Galilee. But when his brothers had gone up to the feast, he himself went up. Not openly, but as it were, in secret. Now the note in my New American Bible says here, I am not going up, uh, this is an early attested reading, but some of the scribes added not yet. So I'm not yet going up, because they see a problem. If Jesus says I'm not going up, and then he does go up, then he has told one. And that would mean something that, because it, the Bible says it is impossible for God to lie. So there you have it. 
Now, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, ordered the death of certain individuals. He was a political uh, leader, and at the time when they did not have the Geneva Conventions to step in and set things right, he had as a political leader, much as the political leaders of our present time, uh, to step in and do what was necessary to preserve decency, to preserve uh, the order, and uh, to make sure that the oppressed people are not uh, forever under the oppression of others. Just like Moses was commanded to uh, move forward, and Joshua after him, with, filled with the Holy Spirit, went forward in battles, killing thousands upon thousands. If you read the book of Joshua and then you read the book of Judges in the Bible, Dr. Shura says that's the Old Testament God. Well, it still is your God. And Jesus rose from the dead. When we dealt with this last night, Dr. Shirosh could not provide any clear evidence that Jesus actually rose from the dead. In fact, he couldn't provide any evidence that Jesus died in the first place, that he died on the cross. You know, in the Gospel according to Luke, in chapter 13, verse number 33, it says it is impossible for a prophet to die outside of Jerusalem. And we will agree that Jesus was a prophet, and we know that Calvary was outside of Jerusalem, meaning where the cross was. That means that Jesus didn't die on the cross. Very simple. According to the Bible, Jesus could not have died on the cross, otherwise this verse is a mistake. So finally, there is no evidence that Jesus actually rose from the dead. We should take the appearances as uh, appearances of the real life Jesus, who never actually died. So this is a very important point. Now, in the last few minutes I have remaining, I want to just touch upon very briefly Dr. Shirosh's book entitled The True uh, for Khan. Uh, first, uh, we should uh, uh, recall that Muhammad, peace be upon him, was sincere, and he really believed the Quran came to him as the word of God. On the other hand, the true Furqan begins by saying, Uhiya ila Safi, it is inspired to a Safi. According to the Quran, it is the gravest sin for a person to say that God revealed something to him if God didn't reveal anything to him. And you and a Safi know that God didn't reveal anything to him. That's why in your translation of it, you put it, inspired to inspired by a Safi. That's what you've put. But it, uhiya ila a Safi means inspired to a Safi. Don't change the rules. Don't fudge things. Okay. Now, <laughs> now it, it, throughout the text, the author is saying, this is uh, what we inspire. Who is the we? He's speaking for God. And for a man to speak for God, I think is both on Muslim and on Christian, if he deliberately does that. Muhammad did that because he was sincere. He believed this was from God. Uh, Asafi was not. Neither are, are you. Uh, now, the name of God. Of course, Muhammad began by reciting uh, uh, in the name of God. But uh, Asafi begins uh, by saying, uh, The copyright is protected. <laughs> and the, the way of the prophets in the Quran is always to say, Look, I'm not demanding any wages for this. I'm preaching it freely. And the gospel says from Jesus, As you have received it freely, freely shall you give. Now, there is a doctrinal error in the Basmala as it is given in the true Furqan. It says, Bismil Ab al Kalima al Ruh. It conflates the three persons, which is a doctrinal error according to standard Christian definitions. Whereas in the Gospel according to Matthew, where the baptismal formula is given, it's given as Bismil Ab wal ibn wal ruh al Qudus. The wa is essential there, Dr. Shirosh, to make sure that the persons are separated and that they are not fit into one. When you say Bismil Ab al Kalima al Ruh, it means in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. It's not three persons, but one person. And you have made, in fact, a very, in, uh, uh, very clear doctrinal error in that. So how can we believe in a book that has such doctrinal errors? And how can you put forward that book as a match for the Quran when obviously it is not? Ladies and gentlemen, if you'd like to take your seats, we'll be beginning the question time very shortly. As we restart, can I remind you of a number of things again. Please again, turn mobile phones off. Someone got caught out in the first half, not saying who. Um, but if you can make sure the mobile phones are off, please. 
Can I reiterate uh, what we asked beforehand? I, I know a lot of you have had time maybe to, to buy something to eat or drink. Um, please wait till you're outside and, and uh, don't eat while we're in here. Drinking bottled water is fine, but nothing else. Thank you. Um, once again, when we have the questions, in order to maximize time and to give the speakers maximum time to answer and to get through as many questions as possible, could I ask that we save our uh, applause uh, or any other comments we might like to make uh, until the end of the evening? In other words, after each question uh, and, and response from the speakers, if we could just remain quiet so we can, we can work through. Um, the speakers will have three minutes in response to each question, and they may wish to use that time uh, in making comments about the previous uh, the, the speakers answer the previous question and then responding to, to the question that's actually being asked. So are we ready to begin? All set. The first question goes to Dr. Sirosh. Uh, you're claiming that Muhammad copied the Bible. Then is it not equally true that the same claim can be made about Jesus copying from the Jews? Thank you very much. He was a Jew. He was not copying from the Jews. He quoted some scriptures fulfilling his life and his truth. Since uh, Shabir likes scholars, I'd like to read to you the beginning, therefore, of Luke chapter 1. Inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which are most surely believed among us. Remember, he was a doctor. Just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us. It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. Please remember what I shared with you, that the Gospels are different views of Jesus by different writers, fulfilling their vision and their understanding of who Jesus is. In chapter 1 of the book of Acts, we see the same writer, Dr. Luke, writing concerning the same to the same person. Theophilus must have been an important person. The former account, chapter 1, verse 1, I made O Theophilus, concerning the book of Luke, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. He had finished the gospel. He told the life of Christ, what he did, what he said, his death, his resurrection, his appearances. Now he's trying to show what has happened after that. So he says, until the day in which he, taken up, was taken up, after he threw the Holy Spirit had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he has also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God and being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Notice the response, what happens on that day. Chapter 2. Now when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now they were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men, from every nation under the heaven. And when the sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused, because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not these all speak Galileans? Now... And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, <coughs> Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and all the rest of them. And all of a sudden you realize that whereas the Quran came in one language, as if God speaks only Arabic, when the Holy Spirit came, 17 languages. Today the Bible is interested in about 2,500 languages, so people all over the world will know that God loves everybody. He doesn't just love the Arabs or the Jews, or the Americans, or the Scotch. 
He loves everybody. He loves you and I love you too. Thank you. Now the Holy Spirit inspired people to speak in other tongues, but he hasn't given me the gift of Arabic yet. <laughs> and many of the questions to Shabir uh, require at least Arabic pronunciation, if not the ability to read. So you'll have to forgive me if I stumble, uh, and one or two bits I'll actually pass the question to Shabir to read himself. First question, uh, here goes. Uh, Ibn Masood's Quran, Quran had 111 surahs. Ubi Ibn Kaab's Quran had 116 surahs. Zaid ibn Tahat's Quran had 114 surahs, and Abu Musa's Quran differed from all the above three Qurans. Which one of these Qurans was on Loe Mahuz? Uh, if it was Zaid's Quran with 114 surahs, then would you identify any verse in the Quran to substantiate that? And in case you missed it, that's the question. Yeah, that's fine. Now, you must uh, understand from my previous uh, statements that all possibilities are on the Lawahul Mahfuz. So that does not mean that all possibilities are pleasing to God and approved by Him. They're allowed to happen, uh, but there are certain things which He approves of. So knowing that, we can say that everything that has ever happened has been in the Lawal Mahfuz. So everything that has ever existed is in the Lawal Mahfuz. So all of these Qurans are in the Lawal Mahfuz. But which ones are approved of? Well, when we look at this, we see that in fact, uh, what uh, uh, is reported about uh, Ibn Masud is that he had uh, a, a text which did not have the Surah Fatiha and did not have the last two surahs. The explanation for that is that he thought because these are prayers, they are not like the rest of the Quran which is God's address to us. These prayers at the beginning and at the end, the first and the last two, are prayers that we address to God and he did not think that that should be written in the book in the same way, if those reports are correct. That does not mean he did not believe in the content of these surahs. He recited the same in his prayers and in his uh, supplications to God, but he did not consider them to be part of the text. Uh, Abdullah bin Obayi is said to have had two extra surahs, but when you look at what the two extra surahs are to make them 116, it reads, Allahumma inna nasta'inuka wa nasta'afiruka wa nu'minubika wa nasta'afiruka wa alayhi, and uh, you will recognize this to be the du'a kanut, the two of them that we normally uh, recite. So there is nothing here that is foreign and strange to the Muslim ear. It is possible that uh, in, in the early days of Islam, some of the companions might have been taught certain things from the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, or through intermediaries. And uh, it, they might not have been very clear about some of the rough edges. Uh, is this part of the Quran or not? But it is through the continued effort of the scholars of the first generation, those who lived and walked with the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that we have the Quran finally established uh, in a text which has 114 chapters, no more, no less. And this is the one that we feel is approved uh, by the Almighty God, though he did allow for others to exist as people made copies uh, and to the best of their abilities. Now, is the Quran really copied from the Bible? No, you will find that there are things in the Bible that will never uh, set foot in the Quran. Like, for example, Ezekiel chapter 23, verse number 20, uh, which uh, describes the men and uh, the size of them, of their privates, and, and the amount of the gushing fluid like that of horses and donkeys. That, of course, uh, does not belong, many would think, in, in a book that calls itself the Word of God, and certainly it's not in the Quran. When the Quran deals with the stories, you can see improvement. Dr. Shirosh says that men and women are equal. Tell us that from the book of Genesis. The Quran says that the devil whispered to both of them. The Bible says that the devil whispered to Eve and used her as the gateway to get to, the, to Adam. So the woman is to be held in suspicion and was held throughout the early Christian centuries. Does the New Testament do any better? No, read it for yourself. Thank you very much. Um, next question to Dr. Shirosh. Uh, you referred to the cutting, off of thieves, uh, the cutting off of the thieves' hands in the Quran. Uh, it said that during the first 400 years of Islam, only six hands were cut off in the whole Muslim world. Such was the, such was the deterrent that during the caliphate of Omar ben Abdelaziz, no one accepted charity. But why do Christians in this country and elsewhere go to prison for their sins if Jesus redeems them? Why not walk away if their sins are forgiven? Thank you. I love you so much, I would not respond to Shabir's last statement, but I would simply suggest you read the Quran about paradise and the river of wine, the river of honey, the river of water, the river of milk, and the virgins. I think that is enough. As for the question, 
I think that I'd like to have verification that only six people lost their hands. And if that is true, it means they did not obey this instruction. Secondly, in the verse where Muhammad announced after he conquered Kaaba, that today I announce your religion as Islam, in the same verse it says, if you are hungry, you can steal and you can lie as a such without any repercussions from Allah. He allows that sort of thing. In our culture and throughout the world, there is wrongdoing and punishment. So a person goes to jail because he is under civil law. I think all of you remember the famous words when Jesus was asked about what to do for the government, for the temple. He asked for a coin. He didn't have any money with him. He gave him a coin and he asked, whose image is there? Caesar. He announced, very simply, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, give to God what is to God. You must understand we are citizens of two kingdoms, heaven, if we are born again, truly, and earth. So we have those responsibilities. And as such, if you do wrong, you belong to jail. You have to pay. The forgiveness we talk about is when you really, as a friend, as a brother, do wrong to your brother in daily affairs and he asks you to forgive him, yes. But there are laws and bylaws, there are commandments, ten of them, and associates of that. You don't steal, you don't lie, you don't cheat, you don't do this and that. If you do, then there is civil law against that. So I do believe with all my heart that the word of God really demonstrates love for each other but there is also payment for the things that you and I may do wrong because there are civil laws that stand with that. God bless you and thank you. A question now to Shabir. The, uh, the Quran says in Surat Maryam that Jesus spoke out when he was in the cradle that he was a prophet. Uh, the Quran says that Jesus will come back again. How about Muhammad? Will he come back? And related to that, the Quran says that Jesus was born without a father. How about Muhammad? I think the key part is, is will, will Muhammad come back as Jesus will? Well, actually, there's no passage in the Quran that, uh, that clearly says that uh, Jesus will come again. But it has been commonly interpreted uh, uh, as such. There are two verses which have been interpreted uh, in that manner. Um, and at the same time, there is no, nothing that says that Muhammad will come again. Well, probably the reason for Jesus' second coming uh, is that he needs to clarify to the world who exactly he was. Because uh, from the Muslim point of view, uh, one group of people erred in rejecting him altogether. And another group of people erred by elevating him to the God that he never was and he never claimed to be. Uh, so when he comes back, he will clarify the situation, he will worship with the Muslims, and he will explain what his true teachings were before they came to be corrupted by other teachers. You'll recall from the New Testament that he said that uh, false teachers will come in and sow the weeds, but the weeds will be allowed to remain until the last times. And it looks like uh, St. Paul might have been the object of that prophecy. Now, what about um, wine? Dr. Shirosh has a problem with wine, it says, but the book of Judges in chapter 9, verse number 13 says, Must I give up my wine that cheers up Elohim and men? Who is Elohim? Isn't he the creator of the heavens and the earth? But probably here it just means gods, in which case it is even acknowledging the existence of other gods than the one true God, which uh, puts us into uh, hordes of problems. Now, Dr. Shirosh seems to have a problem also with uh, the cutting of hands. But uh, the book of Deuteronomy, in uh, chapter 25, verse number 9, uh, tells us, well, if we start with verse number 11, when two men are fighting and the wife of one intervenes to save her husband from the blows of his opponent, if she stretches out her hand and seizes the latter by his private part, you shall chop off her hand without pity. And you say there's equal treatment for women? Where is the verse in the Bible that says that a man's hand may be chopped off? 
Um, in, in fact, um, the, where is the mercy he had asked us? And the mercy is in the ruling of, uh, of Omar, uh, the second caliph, when he felt that people were stealing because they couldn't do any better, they needed to eat, uh, so he allowed that. That doesn't mean that uh, justice is served in, uh, in, in this way to say there's no civil law, but it means that uh, the law can be compassionate uh, dealing with the circumstances. If somebody is uh, racing down the expressway, he should be charged with speeding. But uh, if he's rushing his wife to the hospital because uh, she's about to deliver and he wants to make sure he ensures uh, her safety and the safety of the baby, that's a different circumstance. And Dr. Shirosh thinks that Jesus was never violent, but Jesus never had the opportunity, you see. In Luke's Gospel, chapter 19, verse number 27, he describes himself as that king who will eventually say, Now, as for those enemies of mine who did not want me as their king, bring them here and slay them before me. But unfortunately, he never reached that stage to be able to exercise that level of authority. But apparently, according to this, he intended so. Now, of course, you think that when he comes back, according to the book of Revelation, his tongue would be a sword and he will exercise that kind of authority. So don't tell us that Jesus was an entire pacifist. Your books belie you. Uh, next question. <clears throat> Excuse me. Next question to Dr. Shadosh. If Jesus is God... Is he asking himself on the cross, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do? Uh, and when he asks, uh, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Is he talking to himself? Before I address that, I think I'd like to remind Shabir, challenging Shabir. You have a major problem. You are, unfortunately, stuck in time. You go to the Old Testament, jump over the Old Testament and come to the Quran. See, where the Quran is connected to the Old Testament mainly and forget the New Testament. You know that revelation is progressive, right? So if God spoke in the Old Testament, then he moved to the New Testament and brought the new way of life in the Sermon on the Mount, the golden rule. Do unto others as you would them do unto you, all right? Why do I go backwards? If the revelation of God is true, hmm, why do I have to go backward? You go keep going back, 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 back. We, we are seeing a God who reveals himself during time and space. And finally, as we read in chapter one of, of the book of uh, Hebrews, finally reveals himself as a person who came to you and to me, veiled in the human flesh. When the people in the Garden of Gethsemane got a glimpse of him when he said, after he was praying, I am he. They fell to the ground. When he appeared on the mountain up beside Nazareth, Mount Tabor, we believe, the three witnesses, because the Jews will not accept a witness, there have to be three, Peter, James, and John, they fell flat on their faces. Now as to the question of uh, whoever wrote that question, please remember, your difficulty is solved when you realize God is a triune God. Jesus was not talking to himself. He was hidden in human flesh. As a man on the cross, he prayed to the Heavenly Father. If you read the book of John, you will see that beauty, that truth, as Jesus demonstrated, not only he was fulfilling the prophecy of Psalms 22, my God, my God, why did you forsake me? So that the Jews around would know he was the Messiah fulfilling the will of God. But he also ended up by saying, into thy hands I commit my spirit. Jesus was the Spirit of God, don't forget, but he was also a perfect man. And God through him wants you to be a member of this family and discover the truth that can set you free. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next question to Shabir. Surah Al-Nal, verses 98, 99, and 100, confirms that Satan has no power over those who read the Quran. How does this match with Muhammad, who apparently was bewitched for 40 months by Lobid im El Asim, where he was not able to know what he did and what he did not do? If this is the case, how can you trust him in his inspiration? Now, the report that the Prophet Muhammad, uh, peace be upon him, was uh, bewitched um, is uh, found in the Hadith, of course, not in the Quran, and many would question the validity of these Hadiths, which uh, in fact report so. But even if we accept these as uh, authentic reports, uh, that does not uh, make any difference because the Muslim faith is that that uh, text which comes from the final uh, 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 
the final phase of the Prophet Muhammad's life, uh, especially what he recited during the last month of Ramadan of his life in the presence of Zayd bin Thabit, that eventually came to be copied in the text produced by Uthman and sent to various parts, and we have that even now. So that is the text that is approved by God, finally. And we have every confidence then that this is the work, work of God. Plus, uh, in my nine reasons I've given, mo I've mostly examined the text as it is now in our hands. And we have seen that the text as it is now, obviously, is by divine providence, especially the way that the numerical system uh, shows uh, a relationship between the number of verses uh, in each uh, chapter with their chapter numbers. I think this is remarkable, and it shows that the Quran has not been changed over time. As for uh, Dr. Sharosh's saying that the uh, God is triune, I think he made the Nestorian heresy, or he committed the Nestorian heresy that he himself castigates in his own book. Because if you say that Jesus uh, died only as a human being, as the Messiah, but not as the Word of God, then you have separated the two persons. And uh, you have now caused one to die and one to stay alive. No, you have to say that both died as God and man. But of course, you know that if you say that God died, we'll ask you who ran the world, and so you're running away from that question. <laughs> but, but, it, but then you've committed a heresy. And it shows how difficult the problem is. The, this uh, idea that God is God is not uh, really a true idea. Now, Dr. Shirosh wants me to uh, understand the New Testament. But you see, folks, the promises in the New Testament are built on the Old. And the Old Testament has to be accounted for as well. Dr. Shirosh thinks he has the Holy Spirit. But uh, you know the Holy Spirit is given twice in two different Gospels. Well, in, in Gospel according to, to John and then in, in, Luke, in Acts of the Apostles according to Luke. They're two different times. So Luke does not know that John already gave it because Luke says that you must stay in the city until that time comes. And so they stay in the city until they get this remarkable influx of the Holy Spirit. Uh, two different writers both know that the Holy Spirit came, but they're not quite sure when exactly, and they contradict each other. Because Jesus in John chapter 20 breathes on them and says, Receive ye the Holy Spirit. Now, according to what Dr. Shirosh said earlier, the Holy Spirit, according to, uh, according to Jesus, will enable you and tell you what to say. So you don't have to think about what you're going to say in advance. And you can see how well Dr. Shirosh has lived by that. He's been really planning. Perhaps he's not so certain that he has the Holy Spirit. And that shows the nature of the Holy Spirit. You cannot be sure you have it or know that you really do have it. Thank you. Uh, question to Dr. Shirosh. Uh, if Jesus died for our sins, does this mean that he died to allow me to continue to commit uh, adultery and to steal and to kill and so on? Shabir, remember, the Bible is, is inspired by the Holy Spirit. So I'm reading the Word of God. So the Holy Spirit works that way, you know. All the best to you. I love you anyway. I love you too. <laughs> <laughs> the answer. First, Romans chapter 12. I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, but all members do not have the same function, so we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Then he talks about the gifts in which you see the work of the Holy Spirit. Secondly, I think you need to understand, please, that a person who is born again, he is to live according to the new, new laws of God. And again, the Sermon on the Mount, the highest moral standard the world has ever known, is what he's to live by. Third, Jesus said, by their fruits you shall know them. Okay? So as far as I'm concerned, if you are a born-again believer, among the things you can see is your love for your enemies. I love the Jews who are responsible for the death of my father. I love the Muslims who are responsible for his being hurt. I love the others who were doing this and that. I love everybody because as a Christian, I cannot be a true Christian and hate my enemy or else my Christianity is just like any other religion. So I am to demonstrate by the fruit of the Spirit. What is that? 
Here is Galatians chapter 5 verse 19. Notice the difference between a worldly person and a true Christian. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outburst of wrath, selfish ambition, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, here's the difference. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Isn't it marvelous that we are all given the privilege to let Jesus come into our life through the Holy Spirit when we confess and repent and then demonstrate the fruit of the Spirit. What a magnificent world this would be when we truly can love one another and say, I'm sorry, I've hurt you. Forgive me and don't be embarrassed to admit you don't know everything, right? No, not so. But we can say, okay, let's work together. Let's love each other. Let's be helpful and understanding. What a marvelous privilege this has been. Thank you. And uh, because time's moving on, the last question uh, of the night uh, to Shabir. Uh, as Muhammad recommends reading the Holy Bible in uh, Surah 10, verse 94, and Muslims revere Jesus as a prophet, why then, when reading the Bible, do Muslims not take seriously the unique claims of, that Jesus makes about himself? Well, in reading the Bible, Muslims are aware also of the Quranic verses which uh, seem to indicate that some changes have occurred. For example, Surah 2, verse number 79 says, Woe to those who write the scripture with their own hands and then say it is from God in order to profit uh, thereby uh, with it a little. Uh, and uh, another passage says that they move their tongues uh, therewith that you may think it is part of the scripture, but it is not from the scripture. Uh, and so on. So uh, we have to then have a, a cautiously optimistic approach in looking at the Bible. There may be revelations there from God, but at the same time, uh, some additions uh, and insertions from human beings. Muslims think that a, a large amount came from St. Paul, and that in fact made Christianity uh, very difficult to explain. If you ask, for example, if Jesus died, well, shouldn't we all go free because he paid for us? Well, Paul thought it made sense because he thought he's living in the end times. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17, he said that Jesus will come back and scoop us all up into heaven. And he, he thought that he would be included in that first scoop. So then, uh, he thought that things are settled, the judgment has come, it's all done. But of course, now, 2,000 years later, it looks like Jesus hasn't come back and will not be coming back. Uh, or if he will be coming back, uh, it looks like we're in a different uh, world altogether. Uh, Christ, early Christian believers felt that they had the Holy Spirit, but when so many different sects all claim to have the Holy Spirit, it looks very different. Paul introduced uh, some pagan ideas and practices into the whole system. The idea of the Eucharist. Muslims saw for the first time recently, uh, during the Pope's uh, funeral, that people are eating something and drinking something. Uh, and they feel that they're drinking the blood of Christ and eating the flesh of Christ. This, of course, harkens back, according to Robertson in his book, Pagan Christs, to a time when people did, in fact, think that they could eat their God and drink his blood. Uh, but, of course, as Dr. Shiroz said, there is a progressive revelation. And the revelation has, in fact, progressed. It has bypassed Paul and gone straight to the Quran, to Muhammad, to tell us that, in fact, we need to understand Jesus as he really was. The, the Muslim call is not for Christians to give up belief in Jesus, but to recognize him as he was before the layers of tradition came to obscure him, before the teachings of Paul, to read back behind the lines and see who was this real man who walked in Palestine a couple of thousand years ago. A man walk walking in Palestine wouldn't look like God. He looked like Dr. Anish Shirosh. Uh, just as handsome. Uh, so we shouldn't, there's no reason why we should take him for God. But of course, the stories about him developed later on. And this is what the Quran came to clarify and to correct. I think Dr. Shirosh is right. We have much to discuss and we can discuss all night, but at the end we should agree to love each other, to work together hand in hand, uh, to deal with some of the common social problems that face both Muslims and Christians, and uh, to ex exhibit the love that is characteristic uh, of the teachings of the Bible and of the Quran. Thank you very much.